Welcome, everyone. It's Hollywood on the Rocks on a Wednesday. My name is Chris Gore from Film Threat. Big show today. And happy Valentine's Day to all of you. And for some of you, Singles Awareness Day. Today on the show, part three of The D-Files. That's right. It's Alan Ng's Disney expose and part three just dropped now at filmthreat.com. We're going to talk about it. Plus, movies about love that we love. That's happening on the show. And a couple other things I'm very excited about. Amelie is in re-release. One of my all-time favorite French films. If not, my probably my favorite French film. And an interview with a WGA seasoned screenwriter named Jim Agnew. He'll be joining us at the end of the show today to talk about well, a lot of things, including Amazon's DEI rules, I think worth discussing. I think other people, it's gotten the attention of some other people. We're going to talk about it. So let's get things kicked off. Let's get things started. I know Alan is waiting in the in the wings. Where is Alan Ng? I know he's somewhere here, but let's go. I have no idea where Alan is, so this is going to be a little awkward for me. I don't know. It's... May your first child be a masculine child. Nope, nope, nope. I love breasts. Women look at other women's breasts. Gay men love breasts. One thing that could unite the world is breasts and cleavage. I just, I really believe that. I truly believe in breasts. They're very patriotic. Alan! 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 Al! Alan! Yeah, happy Valentine's Day to you, too. It's a... Yes, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Do you remember when you were a kid and you used to, like, get those little boxes of, like... Oh, yeah. And you the you'd, cards, the and you cards give them out to every kid, including mm -hmm. the ones you didn't like and were annoying. Yeah, and it was just like sort of a thing you passing out these little pieces of paper. Yeah, there was a time where the teachers didn't give a list out of your class. Oh, you really? You had to remember it, and I don't know. I had a big class, so for my little kinda, Asian mind, I kind of they should just get those for adults. Why not just get all your adult friends, get these little cardboard cutouts, get different themed things. It would be fun. It would be fun. But we have, we have a lot to talk about. We got to talk about the story here. But before we do that, let's see who is waiting in the wings. Who's in the chat? Who is in the comment? Look at this. Look at the comments are on fire. Oh, wow. Super chats already. Let's go. Hey. What is this background of ours? <laughs> it's a new background. Two Penny Puppet for 999 says, Hey guys, the AFI has a list of the 100 best films. Do they have them listed? Do they have the films listed in order of greatness or are they listed randomly? If so, how should I proceed? Okay, first of all, the, it is a random list. It's not like number one is great or whatever because that would just cause too much debate. Um, my suggestion is I like to go by eras. So I would go through the list and I would find like all of the movies from the forties then maybe the fifties, sixties, that would be my suggestion sort of coming up to present day in film history. Only a suggestion. There's no wrong or right way to do it. Alan, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, th this list has been around for a while, right? Uh, yeah. Cause I'm pretty sure I saw it two years ago. Um, but uh, Oh gosh, I hate going over lists like that. First of all, it's so subjective. And uh, AFI, I don't know that I would kind of put AFI up there as, you know, the the the, the organization that represents my tastes uh, perfectly. But, they, you know, they do include some really great films in there. So I would start with Casablanca. Well, there you go. Very good suggestion. Movie Godfather. Godfather. Then, go then go to Airplane. Okay. I'm not going to, if I do another Godfather quote, we're going to end up with another video. <laughs> Our faces grafted onto it. It's always chilling to see that. 
Uh, thank you to Penny Puppet. Uh, One Punch Man Tolkien fan member for five months says, Chris, do you put anything in your coffee? And is it medium or dark roast? I generally go with a medium roast and I put in a splash of cream really just to cool it off. Because I can't, if my coffee's too hot, I got to wait. I'm very impatient. So uh, to allay my impatience, I throw a little splash of cream. If you're, if you're, if you're curious, but thank you for that and appreciate your membership. I'm going to go to some member. Oh, here we go. The Icelandic Filipino for 750 Martian pesos says, am I the only one that thinks Cindy Sweeney isn't that hot? Yes. Which, yes. Unfortunately, that would be a yes. I think she is. I think her sexiness is not just from her looks. Let's be fair. I believe sexiness comes from attitude. It really comes from an attitude. Uh, it's not, it's not all about looks. So they, and I think she just has, I don't know. You got to see that movie. Anyone, but you Alan saw it. What? Seven times now. That's I think seven times. Yes. That's although right. again, she is not naked in that movie. Well, you there is, skin. you see lots of skin, but she's you don't, you don't in know. the shower naked, but you're, she's, but in the shower oriented in a way that is not as revealing as one would have liked. Easy ended in a certain way. Right. Uh, let's see. Cast again. Member for five months says fantastic Four reveal. All art is dead. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, probably. So who is yeah. Johnny storm? I, I, uh, I actually, we're going to go through it in a second. Okay, Just okay. now let's get through these chats. Right. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about all of that. Alan, I got a very organized show. Yeah. That I pretend to. Um, were you guys going to discuss Madam Web on Friday? That movie is getting torched. Uh, 100%. Alan actually, Alan booked a theater to himself. That's how much of a fan he is. I know. Yeah, I'm seeing it tonight by myself in IMAX. And uh, I swear, I feel so sorry for the people who work there. Because they are literally waiting for me to leave the theater so they can go home. You're going to make 10 cents tonight if you feel it's it's I mean, look, at least you uh, at least you spared your your lovely wife having to see it with you. I, I can't get any of the women in my life to to see this movie. And, okay, and so you, it's, it's for them. Yes, yeah, your your daughter, who is technically probably the target demo demographic. You're, you have a teenage daughter. Yeah. Doesn't want to see it. And your wife who is a woman has no desire to see it has no desire to see it. Yeah, I love I that mean, pause a, female, a female superhero movie is not the thing that excites her. I think that I'm going to go off on a wild theory that I actually think that women don't like female superhero movies. They like to see men in their superhero movies. Mm -hmm. It's where they like sexy dudes. I, yeah. Just weird. Come out and say it weird. Hey, Anarchity 83 has become a YouTube member. Now wait, Anarch Kitty eighty three is not your. First of all, thank you for becoming a member, but that's not your name on X where I follow you. But your her meme game is so on point. She is a meme ma, meme mistress, mistress. She's a mistress, and there's something I'm sure I'll say something inappropriate uh, if I keep going. Uh, Snow Queen Elsa also became a YouTube member. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to explain something I, I made. Um, Doyle status is hope the WGA writer speaking out won't get blacklisted. Might be too late. Yeah. And we'll also, about a, it. even if he wasn't, he still can't get work. Missing super chat from last Friday. Oh, yeah. Nicholas Vargo for 499. We always appreciate him. I had a hard time re renewing my gifted subscription, but once I figured it out, it was easy. Two bucks a month for level one is well worth it. Guys, do it. And Alan Horkin says, Chikes. Okay, I want to explain Chikes. So on the GNG &G Daily, okay, somebody talked about how Beardo and drunk 3PO celebrate their birthday month. And the one thing I was trying to say, and I normally like dictate my chats into like my phone, I'll click it, the microphone, I'll just kind of dictate it. And I don't check the spelling. And it's like chicks. I said, only chicks, women celebrate their birthday month 
no man, no self-respecting man would celebrate a birthday month, much less a birthday week or a birthday weekend. You get a birthday. That's all you get, drunk 3PO. You get a day and you're done. Now, for women, it's different. There are many women that it's like, what am I going to do for my birthday month? I don't know. They're planning celebrations and this. And they're going to do the, the brunch and mimosas. With it's, it's, it's interminable sometimes. Guys, we don't care. And for women, let them have that. But I was very surprised. And so I asked, somehow it came out chikes. Someone thought it was a slur, but it could be a new one. We need we need new slurs. We can't use the, no, maybe we should come up with some new creative one. We can't yeah. use the old ones. I mean, this was it like. We won't get us canceled in any way. So, yeah. Well, I'm, I always love the story where like at, at uh, Ren and Stimpy, they couldn't use the word booger. At Ren and Stimpy, there were a lot of like, um, at Nickelodeon at the time, there were a lot of women in the front office that were trying to kind of censor Ren and Stimpy. This is all an old issue, an old issue of Film Threat. And so instead of using the word booger, they you came up with the name Nose Goblin. So maybe Chikes, I don't know what Chikes means, but Alan, feel free to use it. Toxic yeah. Quilts N8 says, the beginning feels a bit sloppy and could use another once over, but the D3 article is pretty good. Looking forward to D4. What do you mean it's sloppy? Toxic Waltz N8. If yeah, there's some that? typos that need to be fixed, let Alan know. Because he was working well, on he, he might be saying it's a little bit wordy or something. Uh, I Yeah, I was saying like, I think it's so dense with info that it's like not YouTuber friendly in the sense that it's yeah. like when you're going through it, we'll, we'll, we'll breeze through it because yeah. There's a lot of things you can't talk about. That it could be more dense, but uh, yeah, right. Obvious reasons. But yeah. Thank you. Toxic Waltz and a, the Avenger Avengers rising to Chris Gore. Would you to Chris Gore? Would you see WB's neglection to doing a live action Superman versus Brainiac movie? A good example of creativity in Hollywood being on the sharp decline. I just think it's an obvious, you know, it's an obvious. I, I don't know why. I think there are many reasons for the decline. And, mm -hmm. you know, obvious decisions like keeping Henry Cavill as Superman is one of them. Siege Perilous says, hail all, looking forward to the defiles. All right, this is, okay. <sighs> Only the first 30 minutes of the show will be taken up with comments. I need, okay. Brock Samsonite says, I went to see both Molly and Max in the future and the taste of things yesterday. Molly and Max was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Best indie film I've seen in years. Taste, Taste of Things was also good, but not for everyone. Willie the Monkey King's music. Question for Mr. Gore. Are you planning on doing any more responses to the WGA's writer's open letter? If so, when are they coming out? Thanks. Um, I already have a file. I don't know. More than likely before the end of February, but there will be a part two to the responses. And GRS became a YouTube member and... Rhino Helix also became a YouTube member. Thank you for that. Christopher Moonlight Productions. Are you guys going to South by Southwest? Will there be a meetup? I got a jury duty summons right in the middle of the festival in Austin. It's only half an hour away from my house. Hoping to get out of it. Yes. Yes, hopefully. And uh, yeah, so uh, the plan is uh, I'll be out in South by Southwest. Uh, regarding meetup, uh, it's not like I can coordinate something like that, but we we may pick a film and say, hey, everyone, this is the film we're all going to go see, and then we'll do a meetup that way. Yeah, but that assumes people can get tickets. What do you mean? It's Look, Alan, here's what you tell people. Let's say you have a screening at 7. Yes. What you do is there's a bar or restaurant that's close to the, the movie theater. Mm -hmm. You get to the bar or restaurant around 5, do the meetup, then walk over to go see your movie. Yeah, if it happens, it'll most likely be at the Alamo Draft House. Which one? The the one in uh, South Austin. The the one where all the South by Southwest movies are being shown and not the ones where the South by Southwest movies aren't being shown. Well, you got to be specific if you're going to organize I don't know the name. Of it. It's like South, oh, South Lamar. That's it. South Lamar. Okay. All right. Because, you know. uh, because a Uber driver took me to the one in, in the North Austin. 
and there was nothing there and i got screwed out of my uber uh my my uber uber let ride. me go through finish this i have 700 <laughs> chat comments i have to get through before we actually start the show hail film threat alan dropping the big d on valentine's seems fitting says yeah that's what my wife said happy valentine's day to all the chikes out there says william owens <laughs> aaron taylor says movies about love american history x oh yeah yeah you mazer says does alan have security guards for protection that's a question for alan <laughs> no do i need it in austin the nerd far away for those of us who are stuck as singles happy singles awareness day by the way got my valentine's day all planned out i am part of uh uh you know i'm part of the singles crowd but you know what i got put me full screen alan i got the best valentine's day all planned out here i have my ornithopter lego i have not bought a lego i've not bought a set of legos in over 25 years i bought the dune ornithopter which just came out and it comes with a bunch of characters from Dune right there. Look, the Baron Harkonnen. So there you go. So uh, good luck with your. Yeah. Valentine's Day. So, have... so tonight you're going to be uh, playing with your ornithopter Lego, and then you'll be playing with your Dune popcorn bucket. Dude, D Dune. I got a Dune. <laughs> evening play no actually i'm going um oddly enough uh dante james and i are, are going to lucha bavoom hmm. in uh hey and Kara Lynn is here says okay that's badass see it's cool someone thinks it's cool thank you Kara. appreciate way, that yeah by the way i should remind you i've seen dune too <laughs> yeah, alan saw dune too and really can't talk about it is that right yeah alan? i can't talk about it till friday I can talk about it will, tomorrow, but I can't talk. We'll, 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 we'll talk about it on Friday. We'll talk about it on Friday. Thank you, Kara. And, and, and that. believe me, there were plenty of seats for you. At the, at oh, I screen. know that. I asked them. They're weird, man. They are weird. I, I'm, I'm I, really, really, I mean, you know, let, let's. I saw in a very small theater uh, with great sound over at Dolby Labs. Uh, you're going to be seeing it in a much bigger theater, and I think it will do more justice for you than, than what I got. All right, well, a couple quick things um, before we get to the D files. We're going to jump right in. But Sons and Shadows gifted five film threat memberships. That's awesome. If you're a member to the channel, a couple things you need to know. One, we do at least one exclusive member stream. Uh, we, we do that once a month. Also, we you get access to our Discord. So look for, we post the link to join the Discord where you can continue the conversation. In addition, exclusive member videos, including one, we have a, a playlist of member videos. Look on this play. I have to show you this, Alan, and I'll tell you all about it. Um, I have to tell you all about this. Where is it in the, um, let me see, in the banners here. Nope, I got to look. I got to find it. Nope. I'm just going to show you this very exciting. Um, I went to see a screening of Godzilla minus one and the director was there and I filmed the Q and a, if you remember a 35 minute interview with the director of, of Godzilla minus one is currently for members only right there. He talks about, what happens at the end of Godzilla minus one? There's a something weird that you see. He discusses it. He discusses his favorite kaiju outside of Godzilla. He he discusses the budget. It's all through a trend. It is. I'm going to show you just a little bit here of this. So good. So let's just look at this for a second. There might be. I got to make sure this is this is right here. Are they in lawn chairs? Yes. No, those are, I don't know what those are. <laughs> those, okay. Alan, you should have been there. It was so incredible. 
it was just I've never seen this big of a line for someone. I mean, um, after he actually signed, there he is holding Godzilla. I was in like the fourth row or so. It was amazing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, okay, I have to apologize for my camera work. It's god awful. Uh, but I was just like, I was trying to get like move around. Anyways, all right, I'm not gonna. Yeah. Going to show you any more? And, and that that uh, moderator needs an interpreter as well. No, it's look. <laughs> the, all I'm saying is there are benefits if you're a member to the channel. You get exclusive videos because Alan and I get to go to a lot of events and we'll film the Q and A's or we'll film kind of interesting things that we're doing. And look for that. A lot of people don't even know. Um, it's just look. There's a members. I started a playlist of members videos, so check that out. A lot of stuff, stuff that maybe I wouldn't even talk about. And hey, look at this. Jim Watari gifted five Film Threat memberships. That's awesome. Check that out. Uh, Gabriel, Gabriella Condor, 20 euros super sticker. That's huge. And thank you. Popcorn Cobra. Hey, Film Threat, I have started a YouTube channel on reviewing movies and TV. What is your advice on growth on YouTube? I got one piece of advice to, for you. Consistency consistency if you're every monday you do it every monday right and we have a show that is uh so we have a new show so we've done two live streams every week for the last two years even during the over two years even during the holidays we actually do our live streams we've never missed it okay we have a new show coming up and it's on mondays and i'm going to i'm going to um you know what? I'm just going to show it to you. Here it is. Monday, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. The first episode of Versus. That's right. Versus. Kira Lynn will be there. Alan and I, Dante James, Pauly from Latino Slant, Baggage Claim. And I don't know who that is. It's, I think Robert Meyer Burnett. That's not Robert Meyer Burnett. That's Jeffrey Wright. Wright isn't it? That's Jeffrey Wright. Why is Jeffrey Wright on there? <laughs> okay, I gotta I gotta talk to Glenn about that. <laughs> but this is our new show. It's a group show, the first time we're doing something like this. So it's gonna be a show where every week on Mondays we'll talk about box office, the biggest movie of the week. It'll be after the weekend, so we can talk spoilers, and it's a big group show. So tune in Monday for versus. Link will be in the description for this episode for that YouTube video, right, Ms. P. Coffee? Okay, good. We're going to do okay. that. Um, so versus, uh, join us. It's going to be different. It's not all about Alan and I. We're going to get a variety of opinions. Uh, my favorite kind of diversity is diversity of thought. You're going to get it. And, uh, so uh, Popcorn Cobra, consistency. Every week, same bat channel, same bat time. My piece of advice for Popcorn Cobra is uh, team up with someone famous. Yeah, and if you can find that, Alan, let me know. <laughs> uh, DSBT says, Mr. X-Ray's dad, I am confused. Did you see Dune 2, meaning also, or Dune Part 2? Yeah. Well, technically I've seen it. It's both, but it is Dune Part 2. So Alan saw Dune Part 2 at a screening. I am actually seeing it. I'll have seen it. By the time we do our next Hollywood on the Rocks, we'll be all about Dune Part 2. Josh L. says, are you guys into or good at movie trivia? Um, Not really. I'm really not that great at movie trivia. I, but the thing is, well, actually, I shouldn't like, I'm just going to downplay it, which is like a what a good like pool hustler <laughs> does. So I'll downplay it and just say that I know a lot of weird trivia stuff yeah but i don't like to play trivia games because of course you're going to ask about things i don't know and then i'm screwed and then once punch man tolkien fan said wait did chris say he is single now uh yeah so not happy about it but whatever <laughs> i i i single for a while let's put it that way i'm just not really public about my personal life but because it's valentine's day and everybody keeps reminding me it might come up in conversation. Uh, 
And Mexican Iron Man, probably one of the most generous giving people in this space. Mike, Mexican Iron Man, gifted five film threat memberships. Check out that interview, the Q&A with the director of Godzilla Minus One. By the way, I saw Godzilla Minus One uh, for the, uh, with Mexican Iron Man, and that was his first time. He told me about it. He told me about yeah. it. It was a great All right. I want to, oh how do we, there's too much to talk about. Okay. Too much to talk about. Here we go. I, I, I have to like, cause this just happened before the stream. Thank you for that. Oh, We're going to go Ramesh. over it. That, that was Ramesh. <laughs> oh, that's Ramesh. That's not Ramesh. <laughs> It's that is not a picture of Ramesh. <laughs> I think it's like. supposed to be. That's not. I got. I'll talk to Glenn. All right. Uh, the cast of the Fantastic Four has been revealed, and there are no surprises. So, um, we already all of this has already leaked out. We're gonna go through all of them here, uh, in just. I a believe minute. Marvel. Uh, Marvel uh, made it official. Uh, not necessarily a leak. Wait, why is this not showing up here? Uh, you okay. got to share screen. Oh, it's not letting me. Oh, that's why. Look, the cast has been revealed. And here we go. Um, I'll, you know what? Let's just do, let's just do a link. IndieWire. My apologies, folks. I'm going to start this all over, Glenn. So here we go. Okay. Sorry. I, okay. Are you... Uh, yeah. Let's do this. Let's talk about the D files. We're going to switch and I'm going to reset. My apologies, oh, folks. We have a lot of people. Maybe I can on. get this one here. Let me. Uh, no, 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 no. I'll figure it out. You want to figure it out? Figure it out. Let's jump right into the default. I, I can pull up the Hollywood Reporter right now. If you want to do that? Pull up the Hollywood Reporter. Let's get okay. this. I, I had like a whole visual presentation, and it's in that stupid thing where it's dot h e i c. You ever done that? But I need oh, yeah. like a PNG file. Fuck technology! I blame <laughs> Apple for changing the format. You know what? I, okay. Uh, uh, this this kind of thing just pisses me off. Just ah. Uh. I am a god, you dull creature, and I will. Puny God. All right, let's get into it. The cast of the Fantastic Four is set, and there are no surprises. Let's look at them right there. If you could pause for a moment. Okay. It's Pedro Pascal. No, scroll up. It's scroll Pedro up. Pascal as Mr. Fantastic. It is Vanessa Kirby as Invisible. Well, I'm going to say Invisible Woman. She's certainly not Invisible Girl. Iban Mas Bacharach as Ben Grimm, the thing, and Joseph Quinn as Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. If you could scroll back up, let's look at that photo. Um, I'll, here's here's what I'll say. Uh, it's better than I anticipated. Better than I anticipated. My only beef is with Pedro Pascal. I think he's been overused. I think he's overused in a lot of things. I think he is a fine actor, and I actually like him. In, uh, I think he's very good in The Last of Us. He's been fine as the Mandalorian. Don't have a problem with him. I don't think he's Reed Richards. I just don't see him as Reed Richards. So um, I'm not super excited about it. And I am, I mean, the Fantastic Four, even before Batman was my gateway comic book, I read reprints of the Fantastic Four when I was a kid. You get the giant size comics. So longtime fan of the Fantastic Four. I'm actually, I was on the set of the Fantastic Four movie that was made by Roger Corman. You can see me in that documentary, Doomed, 
Uh, I even did a cover story on Film Threat magazine um, years ago about the Roger Corman Fantastic Four movie that has never been officially released. So big FF fan. Um, I don't think that Disney is capable of making anything that is not going to be so burdened with DEI requirements that we're not going to just get something God awful. So regardless of the fact that the cast looks right and the fact that the movie, um, the timeline is that the fantastic four it's set in my understanding, November, 1964. So it's set in 1964. It's a period piece. Is that a rumor or is that? No, that's, that's, that's been, that's part of, part of what's been announced. Okay. So, um, Hmm. it's a period film. I like that. I'm still skeptical because it's Disney because it's Disney. So, uh, Alan, what are your thoughts? Yes. Well, I, I am surprised for the most part. Uh, they look like the fantastic four. I, in, in significant ways, the idea of race swapping, you know, Pedro Pascal, uh, you know, I'm okay with it. Uh, again, you know, if they truly wanted to race swap, the, the question is, uh, why isn't the smartest man in science an Asian person? But uh, I'll let that one go, and I'll tell. Go ahead. I the uh, I'm. I think uh, five years ago, I would have been excited about a Fantastic Four announcement. Uh, today in 2024, uh, all I know is they're going to screw it up somehow, and they're going to they're going to do it royally. And um, I think they'll do it at the last minute. So they'll kind of build a lot of this goodwill, and and then they'll 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 put in some uh, woke some DEI element to it. That's uh, that's just going to piss everyone off. Um, so there you go. Uh, it, this should be an exciting announcement, and it's not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not super excited yeah. by it. Unless you I say just... this announcement was made months ago. I, I think it was made before the strike. So well, it wasn't an announcement. This was all rumored. Well, that's for, what I'm saying. Long is, time, and then the rumors just turned out to be true. Is what? Yeah, it is. but I mean, I think I think the rumors came out as the strike started. The the actor strike. Uh, which means we we've, we've known about this for a very long time, and um, you know, it, again, Disney will screw it up. They will absolutely screw it up somehow. Uh, that's I, that's I, my I have more faith. I, I have more argument. faith in Superman Legacy than I do in the Fantastic Four. Yes, because I think James Gunn, at least when it comes to the casting, mm-hmm. has been. Uh, I I I don't know. I like his choices. I like his choices, yeah. but because Disney. Seem they seem so up their own anus when it comes to um sticking with all these DEI rules, which we're gonna get into that later in the show. Um, I I just don't see them capable of making anything that's worthwhile mm-hmm. at this stage. I don't. Um, and that's so so I'm I I, I don't know, I'm just I'm just kind of kind of resign myself to the fact that none of this is going to be good. I mean, we can look at like some of these, let me um, remove that for a second, Alan, and we'll go through the cast here. Let's check this out right here. Um, so uh, here's Johnny Storm. He seems young, probably brash and could work. Do I, we know what we've seen him in or what people would have seen him in? Isn't he from Stranger Things? I didn't watch yeah. that last. I, mean, I haven't seen. He played. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so he's yeah, Stranger Things, and he's in Gladiator too. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and then we've okay, got so, yeah, Monster best, Rock is from the Bear. I think the best of all this casting is Vanessa Kirby as Invisible Woman. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's, certainly, she's all she woman to me. Passes. Yeah. What's that? She can definitely pass as the Invisible woman and then and then when you look at um the actor who's played we recently saw in that in that um jennifer Lawrence film where she gets full frontal naked the which one this is even moss back rack yeah he's, he's, he's still like big parts and things yeah no i like him i i like yeah. him but i mean ben Grimm i saw is just a little more gruff um i mean maybe I, I, but the well thing is, is, he, he doesn't need to look effect. like he doesn't need to look like the thing he doesn't even look like the thing he's because effectively he's a digital effect. He's, yeah. he's going to be doing the voice. And then of course we have 
Last well, he'll be not, in a latex suit with the uh, with the ping pong balls on it. I don't know if it'll be a, yeah, exactly. He's gonna be walking around, and, and then we've got I don't know. I just don't see it now. Could Pedro? Is he gonna shave? Is he gonna like? They're gonna gray his temples. They're gonna make him give him mm-hmm. sort of a quaff. He's got that. Reed Richards has always had that little curl, like Superman, right? Mm-hmm. And I love that. So I just don't see Pedro as playing that part, but. You know, I want to be surprised. The pr- The big problem is who's making the movie, and that's Disney. <laughs> Let's go to your comments and questions, and we're going to move on to the D-Files right here. We have Andrew Cram, gifted five Film Threat memberships. Thank you for that. And Patro, Patro Station also became a YouTube member. And Aaron Sleeper for 199 Guys, was sure Disney's was going to cast Zendaya. Yeah, exactly. Um, but she's already Mary Jane. Why would they make her? Why would they make exactly. her? Here we go here. Johnny Skinwalker, who's a member. Thank you. Vanessa Kirby cannot play nice and motherly like Sue. She can only do Cold Witch. I mean, remains to be seen. I'll, yeah. I'll give her. That, that's how she's been cast uh, in, in most of her work, so. Yeah, that's the parts that she's played previously. I actually could see her being, I mean, look, she could be a, she's be a completely different person. Here's what I would like. This is a detail. If I were directing this movie, I would use the same blonde hair dye on Vanessa Kirby as I would on Johnny Storm. Mm-hmm. So that they have matching blonde hair to further enforce that they're brother and sister. Just a thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, her her performance in uh, Mission Impossible uh, comes close to what I think the Visible Girl would be, Invisible right. Woman would be. <laughs> Portland One Eight Two is something very bad. Go into your camera settings and set it to most compatible. It will switch off HEIC and start working in JPEG. Most com- camera settings, camera like yeah, on your what? on your iPhone. No, on my iPhone. What? Because the HEIC is the uh, is the iPhone format that allows you to do the um, you know the uh, the multiple frames to choose from the multiple frames, right? Yeah, as opposed to just JPEG. I love JPEGs. Yeah, but you're not using a JPEG if you're in HEIC. Yeah, thank you, Portland One A Two. Appreciate you, Thomas Pickett. Okay, which one is gay? Remains to be thing. seen. It's going to be thing. Johnny. They're going to take Johnny, who in the comics is kind of a daredevil, kind of kind of a daredevil. This he's always into girls. You know, he 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 definitely was romantic uh, with the ladies. Uh, So they're yeah, he'll probably end up being gay. That's good. Good guess. Draconis Reed, Idris Elba, Susan Aquafina, Johnny Dylan Mulvaney and Ben RuPaul. (laughs) <laughs> totally makes sense. That would, that would be, be Netflix's point. version. <laughs> uh, Pascal is Richards. I don't know, man. Bit of a stretch, in my opinion, says John Manley. Mm. He's also a member. Thank you, John. And Pilgrim Media for Two says, will it be the strong whammon trope feminism? Yes. Yes, it's going to be It's gonna be that. But, you know, look, I, of course I'm going to go see it. I'm just, does everything have to be awful from we'll, marvel we shall yeah. see all right it's time it's time alan yes it's time to talk about the d files i'm gonna put on a different wait hang on a second wait yeah, you gotta do the uh alan yeah, alan do it. do it here we go just do it. i have it hit that then just start it no, I, I have to put one thing at a time here. And then... Oh, you're not going to move, use the moving one? Let's go. Part three of the D-Files is here. Alan Ng, just want to thank you. You're doing incredible work with the D-Files. Part three uh entitled uh little subtitle here killer of dreams is here i have read the article um unfortunately because sources are anonymous 
specifics about certain stories have been uh, left out, but it paints a picture of a toxic work environment that is so disheartening. I don't know how anyone would even want to go into animation after what I've read. So tell us, or at least tell us a little bit of like what, you know, before, and, and we'll put a link in the description to the story itself, but Alan, what can you tell us uh, and give us sort of a brief synopsis of, of the story itself? Yeah. So uh, we start off where we last left, where uh, the women in animation, uh, they were helping to actively recruit women to uh, to work on Ryan the Last Dragon. In fact, they're actively doing that uh, throughout the entire industry with, with every studio. Um, they're going for, the, if you go to their website, their goal is 50-50 equity. And uh, that is certainly what they try to do. And you do it in one of two ways. You recruit as many women as you can who have some kind of modicum of talent. And then you force out the men who are currently there. And we kind of look at both of those things. In terms of where uh, where Disney got their talent, um, I referenced this. I referenced this in the in part two, but there was a um, there was a female filmmaker panel about *Ryan the Last Dragon*. Uh, Fawn Vera Senthorn, who is the director of *Wish*, co-director of *Wish*, uh, she was the head of story at this time, and she was helping to recruit. And she makes an interesting statement. Uh, which basically says, uh, da, 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 I'm finding it here. I do have a link to the video in there. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, why is my quote gone? All right. Uh, basically, she says that uh, they went to social media to to recruit artists, female artists. And we found out, uh, thanks to my sources, exactly where that was. And that was off Tumblr. Uh, they went to Tumblr and read it, and they basically, what they did was they just looked there, saw people with a modicum of talent, and said, hey, do you want to work for Disney? And that's exactly what happened. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, and I kind of go through what people thought of the Tumblr talent. Um, the quality just wasn't there. Uh, people who are on Tumblr, uh, they, they're basically, they were uh, artists who basically copied other artists. And which is fine. If you can copy a, a, your favorite artist very well, if I could copy John Byrne, I would be very happy with that. It just shows you have kind of a minimal, minimal level of talent. But then when you're thrust into a professional situation and you have to actually animate a cartoon, um, it's very different. And uh, your your talents are just not there. Um, the other thing is you're in, a, you're in a social media community. You're in a Tumblr community. And what happens there is you, you post your artwork and uh, and everyone compliments you and, and affirms you. Uh, and then if you have any constructive criticism, that's often met with A, one, taking it incredibly personally, and, and B, becoming this war of, uh, you know, of this, this battle of, you know, why would you, you know, you're just jealous of me. Why would you say things like that? And so, the you know, Tumblr is not art school. You're not going to get honest uh, constructive criticism. Uh, you're just going to be uh, uplifted. And if anyone gives you criticism, you're just going to smash them down as best you can. And the other thing is, you know, the, the Tumblr becomes this kind of incel community where they talk amongst, where where the members talk amongst each other and talk about things they wish was happening in, in the world. You know, like, why, why, does, why does there always have to be a villain in a Disney movie? And, and they'll just kind of go off on these rabbit trails. So, well, you know, why does the, the princess always need a man? You know, and... and and this is, you know, what's happening here is Tumblr is not creating artists. They're creating activists. They're creating influencers. And Disney, I think, was very intentional in that, that, that they wanted influencers. They wanted to hire influencers first over, over artists. You know, they, they, they basically said, hey, your, your work is passable, um, but we need your social media influence. And so I think they underestimated their their artistic talent, and over, or overestimated their ability to um, to bring in an audience, and that's kind of where where what what happened there. Well, and, oh, oh, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I just have a follow up question. But no, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. Okay. So, having read through the story, and the story just hit probably I don't know less than an hour ago ish. Um, 
This quote, the goal was to clear out as many old white guys as possible at Disney Animation. They brought in these, and this is this is the thing that blows my mind about this story. Mm -hmm. They brought in artists from Tumblr, and their reasoning behind it was where Tumblr is where you can show off portfolios, right? So right. You see these new that's, upcoming artists. That's the that good thing have, about Tumblr. That's the not, good thing about Tumblr. Okay, good thing, whatever. Tumblr is also a cesspool of hatred and awful, awful stuff. I know this because I did a panel at WonderCon in 2015 that became the subject of some piling on attack that got my panel uh, destroyed. And it was all a bunch. It was a community from Tumblr from this fanfic group that just piled on. It's like, it's like a, um, a, a friend of mine um, who was a teacher she said that um, young girls when they're in junior high are the most evil form of human because of the <laughs> cattiness. So yeah. just saying, and the bullying, the bullying is different with men and women bully differently, right? Boys, when boys bully amongst each other, a lot of it is physical prowess. And then there's some sort of respect that, that, you know, you see a lot of times this happens. I remember when I was in school, you get in like a physical fight with another kid. Suddenly you're friends with that person. And I think that young women tend to, they just act differently. They're very different in their kind of bullying. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll just say coming from that community, this all totally makes sense. Yeah. And a lot of it was, you know, that statement, the goal was to clear out as many old white guys as possible at Disney animation. It became so toxic for some of the people working at Disney animation that people were also to the point where men were afraid to talk to women for things mm -hmm. to get misinterpreted. Like, yeah, I can see that the toxic work environment that was created by bringing in only a certain type of person is what led to a movie like wish. And now post wish, I believe that the Burbank studio is being punished, which is why mm -hmm. Moana two is being made in Canada. Not that like Canada is any sort of, you know, non woke paradise. I'm just saying that, like, it's it's yeah. it's just gotten so toxic. I mean, uh, that's that's the really the impression we get is that uh, look, uh, strange. I'll say this: Strange World, I believe, was the last movie to have any legitimate veteran talent on it, because when Wish came about, you could tell that that everything that Disney had had brought to the game of animation, concerning he was the first. Um, is was completely gone, and it, it seems like that the tactic of removing as many white guys as possible, old white guys as possible, worked. They're no longer at Disney, and Wish is the right. example of that. In fact, that's that's part four of of the defiles here, where we go into Wish. Um, look, uh, one one part where I, I talk about the you know what was the impression of this Tumblr talent uh, from the old from the veterans. And uh, you know they they basically said their their artwork was okay, um, but it was clear that their inspirations did not come from Disney, but it came from what was popular amongst the millennials and Gen Z at the time, and that was anime. Their whole style was built on on anime, the anime they had watched, and that when they asked when the veterans asked them about Snow White, Lady and the Tramp, Hundred One Dalmatians, so on, uh, just met with blank stares. No one no one knew the 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 legacy of Walt Disney, which you would assume anyone who worked at Walt Disney prior to all this, they knew the legacy of Walt Disney front and back. And, and they hired people who didn't know anything about Walt Disney at that point. Well, I um, mean, look at you, to be clear, you wrote this subhead mm -hmm. to your, to your story. Bye-bye old white guy. It's, I thought that was very clever. Alan. Yes. I'm going to give you credit I thought of that this morning. <laughs> No, I like the additional subheads to put things into context, but it's it really became a certain type of person would be hired that led to a toxic work environment. And that's mm -hmm. what the story lays out. Um, yeah. What's unfortunate, where did you source these images? Oh, the <laughs> um, uh, co-pilot. Co-pilot. Okay, there you go. These new hires were recruited as act activists and trained to be bullies. This thing, especially the WIA, Women in Animation, mm -hmm. it's like they're- I, I could do a whole article on Women in Animation, by the way. Uh, I've right. held back on, on that. 
Well, you've mentioned it at least in the last two editions of yeah. this. It, the, 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 the organization is much more sinister, and I'm, I'm kind of working through because women in animation, they have literally taken over animation. Uh, women, the, the, the leaders of women in animation are the leaders of Disney, are the leaders of, uh, uh, let's see, of Nickelodeon, of, uh, of I think, uh, Paramount. Um, they are, you know, the, the head of uh, the women in animation is the head of Skybound Television. Um, yeah, and, and also uh, a prominent member is the leader of the Animators Guild. So the, mm. they have their hands in everything. Well, I'll, 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 I'll just say this, having read the story, and again, we'll put a link in the description so you can go through it. And this is just part three. I, there's a lot more to come as this gets exposed. You're trying to break this down. Mm -hmm. It really was these activists being brought in. And you can, what I think we're going to do before the end of this series is track. when the, Look at the box office for pre, pre all the activism. Mm -hmm. Because this is partially... A, a a piece to show the decline so show yeah. what it was before yeah, we're gonna we we start and, with coco we start with coco and then we move our way down well but but here's the deal it's it's like this is the thing it's not like diversity came in and things went things declined that's actually not the case there were so many diverse types of projects as defined this is the mm -hmm. thing that bugs me about a lot of these young activists they think that they're the first to actually do something when so much of that stuff was done previously it's just that even those projects are being poo pooed well it's not the right kind of diversity even a right. film like um i was talking to or i saw dr gonzo who's a very big supporter of the channel talking about how he found a way to watch song of the south and he just brought back all these memories how much he loved that movie mm -hmm. that's been completely buried completely yeah. buried well and, i would I would submit that Wish is the ultimate, the, is the perfect diverse movie. Yes, and, and yes. When you look at when you look at like the there's like um, a bunch of stills of like all the main characters, and it's like you literally could just title it Diversity the movie. It's yeah. but what I'm saying is it's look, look at the movie Coco, right? Like yeah. that is I love that film. I love that film, and so it's it's and you even pointed out I I saw a tweet from you. It was so good. Chef's Kiss, follow my pal L on on X or Twitter, whatever. Um, you did a thing of like, yeah, um, and you showed a montage of Disney princesses that were diverse from years ago, like going mm -hmm. way back. Like, it, it, you know, acting like that's something new, but it's like you're doing it wrong. God, I, I, I it's so annoyed by that. Well, it wasn't done right. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't done right. Yeah. You know, I mean, they they still complain about. They, there was a whole seminar on the problem of Princess and the Frog and Soul, uh, that that they weren't black throughout the whole film, and therefore it was racist. Well, you know what's going to be a term you're not going to be able to use: blacklist. Blacklist <laughs> yeah. list will be racist. Oh yeah, believe me, that's been pointed out to me, and I, I kept it in because it's appropriate. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we find that there. So this is what the big reveal of this story is not just the activism where um, Disney was recruiting, but the fact that there exists a blacklist in the industry of animators who can no longer work because of their attitudes or whatnot. And it's, it's basically again, another woke policing of art. Maybe you can speak yeah. to that a little bit. Alan. Yeah. I mean the, that's exactly what's going on here. Um, you know, I we bring up uh, the case of Chris Savino. Uh, that's not the story that, that we present there, but but there was a basically during the Me Too movement, Chris Savino, who was the showrunner of the Proud Family, um, he got caught up in the uh, Me Too hype, and they were gunning for him so far, so much so that Samantha B did an entire episode on him. Oh my um, god! And, and so, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna litigate whether he was innocent or guilty or or question the the testimony, but, but what came about was that as a result of, uh, of Chris's suspension from Nickelodeon, uh, the animation guild held a mock trial, uh, and declared him guilty, uh, without him being able to confront his accusers. Um, and they, they basically then sent a letter to every animation house 
and every agent saying to not work with this man for for five years um of course after five years he got a job right uh no he didn't and and what what we found out that there is an actual blacklist animation blacklist out there um that no one could admit to because it's illegal uh and and b uh you know there are repercussions if you start leaking this stuff out which is the whole re which is we're gonna get we're gonna get the yeah. blacklist i someone out there get us this blacklist of animators yeah but because and I, can i tell yeah, you why my selfish yeah, well, reason <laughs> uh i have an animated project that i'm working on i actually have two i've been trying to get this made for years mm -hmm. and um yeah, maybe we'll just make it with only animators that are blacklisted. Blacklist anime, yeah. What if I only hire certain types of people? Well, the type of people I tend to work with are people that can just, you know, have a good attitude and we like to joke around and whatever. Like, But do, um, do you understand if you did that, your your project would not be union approved? I don't care. I'm going <laughs> to make an I'm going to make an indie animated project and I've been working on this for a while and I'm very mm -hmm. excited. Along with yeah. like, I got a bunch of stuff coming up. We'll we'll talk about that another time. Yeah. But like, so I'll just say the the last the last part of this article is just basically the state of of animation in Hollywood, and not just Disney, but everywhere. And it is bleak. It's not good. And um, I think people, uh, I certainly feel like that uh, it's about to implode uh, because a. Uh, there's a system in place right now that, that we're showing here that is toxic, that, that even if you were an animator, you wouldn't want to be amongst animators. And B, I think studios are getting fed up with it. And I think that's exactly why Moana 2 moved to, to uh, Canada. Well, and, and, why, and, and, and as many people have been pointing out, every studio is moving their animation house out of the country because they don't want to deal with, with the crap that's going on uh, here in the states, and it's sad because Disney, Disney, Walt Disney Animation was the last bastion of American animation, uh, and now it's going away. It's moving to Canada, and um, I, I just think that's a result of this industry. Mm -hmm. You know, nope. them hiring a certain type of person, a um, you know, and and that sort of attitude just permeating. I want to address this last part in the piece here someone added if you work in the industry and have a story to tell or something to add and would like to share your story the word story in one sentence used twice i don't like that I should probably rewrite that. on or off the record contact us and in the next d files you're going to show the current state of the animation industry specifically at disney and how the art form of animation is dead and there are no jobs for you here <laughs> and then look, someone added a link and check out the previous article. I know who did that. That's me being an editor and doing. I gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta know how to push it. Yeah, I spent three hours on this this morning. <laughs> but you gotta add those things so people can I get know. context. This well, is hard. you know, it, you, you got to it before. Right, I fine. Can. I'm just, I'm, but, I, you know what? But giving okay. you a little. The, this but this is the thing that I, I titled this "Killer of Dreams." I, I mean, Disney was the dream. You know, there was a time where I was, you know, in my room with my art, with my art pad, just trying to learn to draw. And uh, and I would have loved to work for Disney. There are a lot of people, a lot of kids out there who watch animation and want to be an animator. Uh, yeah. I spoke to someone whose daughter is looking into animation and stepping back and saying, you know, I don't know that there's going to be an industry for your daughter to to be in. That's and, what that's uh, yes, that's what we keep hearing is this mm -hmm. industry may not exist. AI and sourcing things out of America is going to kill the American animation industry. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening. That is the thing that's even more concerned. Forget Disney. I think Disney is lost. Yeah. I am of the opinion that Disney as a company is lost. They're not going to make any changes. The DEI now they've added an A. <laughs> you like to always add letters. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't go with the Jedi thing, but um, the Jedi thing it's it's lost. It's lost. This is an industry that has self-immolated, that has chosen through hubris and narcissism and self-centeredness to just destroy itself. This is where we are. So yeah. 
Yeah, it's sad. I mean, look, the the, the upside is uh, the tools of animation are there off the shelf. You can buy it off the shelf. And if you want to be an animator, I would say this, uh, start animating. You grab this software, learn it, study it, start telling stories. And the second thing is find someone who will mentor you, someone who will give you honest criticism and, and spur you to be better. Uh, and then third, get your 10,000 hours in. Yeah. And uh, and, and I have to believe like with, uh, with the rest of Hollywood, uh, the indie movement is what's going to propel animation forward, not, not the big studios. It's possible. It's possible that mm -hmm. I think that there could be an indie animated movement. Some low budget indie feature yeah. is, is in the cards. Um, and and a, a final thoughts, Alan, before we go to comments. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will tell you when you read this and you read the stories, uh, I will guarantee you it's worse. Uh, you know, we, we talked to you and I talked about how, you know, you get more specific and I'm like, no one, no one will go on the record with anything. Uh, the stories I have are horrible. Uh, the, the situation in the Disney animation studios itself is awful. Uh, and I can't get anyone to go on the record. Um, I know what's happening there. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, you know, we, we go into the whole, uh, what is it? The, the interactions between the veterans and the new recruits. Um, it is, it is a battle between these two, you know, that, you know, e even offering to help and mentor someone, uh, no, no, they don't want anything to do with the old white guys. And, uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the climate is like in there. It's just a weird, wouldn't you want to take the knowledge of someone who's been mm -hmm. a veteran in the industry more than, you know, several decades. I'm, I'm going to just throw out. You, wouldn't you want that as a competitive advantage in your work to be mentored by someone at yeah. that skill level? But there's yeah, well, a weird, you know, it, it's very childish. I find yeah. it. It's really. Well, you, uh, I'll mature. tell you what. I'll tell you what I found out is that these animators, these new recruit animators, they don't want to animate. They don't care about art. They want to get into story. They want or to they take want, over the story. The other thing is that you mentioned in the article is they want to get hired into super supervisory roles yeah. so they want those like they want to be like you know executives the or yeah, the, managers yeah. and the gatekeepers which tells me that they're uh, more concerned about power than art yeah and whatever you think about walt disney um that guy really really he created an industry and a brand that's why at least for now they still call it the walt disney company how soon until the Walt Disney Company disavows the creator and it's just the WD? Yeah. How long until we get to the WD? Any guess, Alan? Oh, it's going to happen soon. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's okay. So, part, there's two more parts. Uh, we're going to look at animation and wish in the next part. The, the uh, part five uh, is going to be titled Fuck Disney which was quoted by a high executive, high level executive when asked, when, when basically given the question, you know, uh, back in the day, Walt would have done this. And the response from that executive was fuck Disney. Well, look, we know we're, there are going to be several more parts of the D files coming. So um, we yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Let's I mean, go to ancillary stuff. Uh, there's, I mean, the stuff we're getting about the theme parks, uh, is incredible. Uh, you know, the, the defiles specifically focuses on, um, on animation. Uh, but there's a lot more to say about the, the, this cancer that is running through the entire Walt Disney company. That, that I think is a separate story outside yeah. of the defiles. I think it's yeah, that's why they will probably be sub stories. Like we could, I could do an entire thing on women in animation, but it wouldn't be Disney specific. Well, let's do it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's go to your comments and questions here. We have a lot of super chats and some comments. I want to get to as many of these as I possibly can. We have a special guest joining us in 22 minutes. So we will do our best. And by the way, uh, hail to the 2,100 people, over 2,100 people watching us right now. Yeah, please smash that like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed. And uh, become a member. All sorts of exclusives. 
think you will be uh, you'll be very pleased. Uh, Red pilled rants for four nine nine. Looks like they went full soy boy on the casting. There's a lot of estrogen going on in there. Uh, that's talking about the Fantastic Four. Thank you, Red Pilled Rants. I think there's Red... only one female cast, it, or unless you're talking about Pedro. Yeah, Red Pill or excuse me, Red <laughs> French Moon for two euros. Who's a member says cool Jean Pierre Janet interview Chris Merci. Yes, um, we have a film threat interviews channel. If you go to our main channel, we have film threat trailers, film threat interviews on the interviews channel. I did an interview all the way from France with the director of Amelie, which is in theaters today. Check out my interview with Jean-Pierre Janet. And he's very happy with your pronunciation. Yeah. Right at the top, you mentioned it. Changer of ways, beep, bop, boop for two. Tumblr hires, explains everything. See, it's kind of a shorthand. Like if you know anything, like, like um, a lot of people have basically traced back to Tumblr. Is that sort of where wokeness kind of like was sprung from? was mm -hmm. a lot of the attitudes on Tumblr, which was very catty place for people to kind of attack each other. All the like cancel culture, like a lot of the toxicity of that came from Tumblr. So um, yeah, recognizing that that explains a lot. Red French Moon goes on to say for five euros, I thought the way was a journey that could nourish your art to make you better in what you have to offer. But no, just Tumblr and chill, apparently. Yeah. Yeah. That's how they hired Matthew Hammond for 499. Mm -hmm. um, could the old white male artists that were fired at Disney sue for age discrimination? Alan? Uh, yeah, look what Gina Cron what's happening to Gina Crona right now. Um, you know, it's it's a very tough thing to to do to sue. Yeah. And uh and and you know, we can we can get into conspiracy theories. I, I think uh I think the courts and the culture is on the side of the young, young ladies. Mentorship is mansplaining says JT for five. Yeah. And that's how they said, that's exactly how they saw it. Oh my God. It's just, here's what's uh, annoying is cause you, obviously this was put together from a lot of emails you got. Mm -hmm. And to be clear when this article was sourced, while people are anonymous, their credits were confirmed. So who they are, when some people sent in employee IDs, right? Like yeah. trusting us with that, which I like, it's like, okay, okay. There, here's your IMDB. You're real. You've worked on a lot of things. Um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, really. So there, I know some of the more specifics of some of these stories and it's even worse than you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Brings Bane member for one month says, Hey, you, did you smash that like button? Do it. Yeah. I'll say that original drafts, I, I had to show it to my my sources, and they're like, "You gotta, you gotta, you gotta Cut make it more generic." <laughs> it's yeah. like you gotta make it more generic. I go, "Oh, this is a great story," and um, you know, that's yeah, unfortunate. I, I, we're 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 literally protecting careers here. Thomas Pickett for ten more on tech. There is open source free software. There is Linux open open software. KDN Live video editing. GIMP photo editing, blender, 3d modeling, mm -hmm. go dot game engine. We have the tools, Thomas yeah. Pickett. You are hundred percent correct. Yeah. I know there are plenty I mean, of tools Unreal engine, right I, now. I've heard so many great things about unreal engine and what it, it's possibilities okay. with animation. we got a lot of super chats here. So we're just yep. going to focus on cool. those for now. Matthew Hammond for four nine nine. Could AI bring animation back to the U S studios already farmed out keyframe artists to Asia. It would allow talented artists to do more. Matthew Hammond, I agree. I know a lot of people are saying AI is the end. No, it is another tool like Photoshop. It's another tool and it can do even more, but it's not the be all end all. You know, yeah. people are giving AI way too much credit. Yeah. And when it comes to television animation, that has been going overseas for decades from, yeah. from the 90s, uh, if not earlier than that. Yeah. Uh, more here from Richard S who's a member for five. I wonder if Shogun survived the Disneyfication of being non-offensive and anti-white male it's on Hulu and looks fantastic. I think that there are sort of outliers. There are shows where I believe that they have creators that are like throw up their hands and like, all right, we're going to follow some of these rules, but what I get on the screen is going to be what I want. How does someone like a Chris Nolan get Oppenheimer made because he gives no Fs. Yeah. And he has a proven track record. He has a proven track record. I think that's why James Gunn, I have, I 
hopeful, I'm optimistic that Superman legacy could basically, and plus I feel like he's got a chip on his shoulder. I feel like he's got a little something to prove with uh, Just a little bit. Marvel. Just a little bit. I happen to know, I can't say how, that uh, James Gunn has off the record said a lot of things about Disney, not Marvel, but Disney that, um, yeah. I, think I don't know. In all the public cool. interviews I've seen, he's been nothing but uh, but glorious about Marvel and Disney and and how well they treat him and everything. I'm just saying, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I can't yeah, tell. I know. Uh, yeah, I think Shogun looks really good, Richard. I agree with you. Yes, good trailers. Good trailers. Darth Racer seven 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 for ten. What would you think about bringing back, say, Tyrone Power and Linda Darnell and others using deep fake? Uh, deep fake face and voice apps to create movies based on the old forties and fifties classics. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it as an experiment, but maybe based on a script. There are a lot of unproduced scripts from that era. There are a lot of unproduced scripts. Yeah. You know, I'd like to see Orson Welles, Batman. Yeah. I'll, I'll say this. Uh, we, we know when we we're watching CG, when we're watching CG effects, so we're going to know when we watch uh, AI characters. Right. But like there's an Orson Welles, look it up. Orson Welles, Batman. Someone tried to do it as a hoax and mm -hmm. it was Orson. It, it, it's a fake story about Orson Welles developing a Batman project in the 1940s and who might've been cast at the time that I would love to see. Uh, I I'm a big fan of, of AI trailers for fake <laughs> movies. Um, we watched one the other week, Wes Anderson's Dune, look it up on the channel. But um, there's some really good work being done with AI. I think it's 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 in the t look. Give me a brush. You know what I'll paint? I, I'm terrible. I can't paint. But you give the tool of AI to an artist who understands how the tool works. I believe great things are possible. So, and that's something I'd be curious about. There were rumors for years that uh, someone had gotten the rights to James Dean's image and we're going to make yeah. a new James Dean movie and they had got the rights from the estate. I've actually visited uh, the town. Um, you, I went to James Dean's grave. I went to the gift shop. I was a huge James Dean fan when I was younger. Uh, I loved the three movies he made, you know, East of Eden, Rebel Without a Cause and Giant. Love those films. Rebel Without a Cause was like, when I was a kid, yeah. it was huge. Uh, Jonathan McIntosh for 10. My eight-year-old son recently watched and was shocked how good Aladdin and Tarzan was from the 90s compared to Strange World from last year. Waiting for the full Disney full reboot when they run out of money. I don't know what's going to happen with that, but I do think that like classic storytelling transcends time. Mm -hmm. This is why so many, this is why Disney's had such a great brand up until now. And the, the brand fell on hard times in other eras, but it was because, you know, they were cheap or they didn't have the leadership. In this case, this is the first time, this is the first time that this is self-inflicted wounds mm -hmm. where the company itself is deciding we've chosen a political path. We're going to vilify half the country. We're going to only make things that service this. And I think that you're even like taking like a political affiliation and, and only focusing on the extremes of that affiliation. But, you know, really good storytelling transcends all of that. It trans transcends politics. It transcends, uh, uh, you know, time. And that's why the, that's why classics are called classics because you don't know. We could see a movie now. It's just like, okay, it was great the time I saw it. Will we be talking about Barbie in 20 years? I don't know that we will. Because I think it's so, the film Barbie by Greta Gerwig, whatever you think of it, is so rooted and comment on now that it will not stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion. But what was great about the Disney brand is when I became a parent, and I, I have two grown children, Alan, you have a teenage daughter, which you should just encase her in carbonite and get through this terrible era in history. Because I, I don't know. I'm like, look, 
<laughs> yeah, no, she sees it. She knows it. I mean, good. Well, she's really smart. I've had yeah. conversations. With Although her. I will say, she uh, she was very excited that Percy Jackson is getting a season two. Oh, so. that's cool. Yeah. So it, it's it's like one of those things you want to pass on to your kids. So you're like, yeah. hey, here's the cartoons I watched: Snow White, or I watched whatever. I watched Robin Hood or Peter Pan. I watched this as a kid. You know what I want to do? I want to sit down with my kids. You've never seen Peter Pan. You've never seen bed knobs and broomsticks. I know I'm mentioning old school classics, mm -hmm. but whatever. What's cool about that, the coolest thing ever, you get the big bowl of popcorn. And I'm talking about in a metal tin, that giant metal tin, right? Filled with popcorn. You sit in front of the TV. You throw on one of these classics. It could be Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins, by the way, first Disney movie Alan Ng ever saw. Yep. In the theater. In the theater. So you sit down with your kids and you watch a Disney movie for the first time together. You get to re-experience that movie through their eyes. It's transcendent. It's mm -hmm. amazing. It's part of one of the great, one of the one of the great things about being a parent is you get to re-experience all of those films. None of these movies being made in the modern era are going to survive. They're going to be a dark blemish on Walt Disney's stellar brand. So, yeah, Jonathan, I feel you. I feel you. Well, you mentioned um, it before, but like when when you when you see someone on social media say, you know, Barbie was the greatest movie ever made, you know, your response is always, "Well, you haven't seen enough movies." Yeah. And 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 it's disheartening to me when we talk about movies and when we see the criticisms of our uh, of our reviews of these movies. You know, that people are just say, it's just a great movie. And it's like, no, you haven't seen a great movie yet because you wouldn't be talking like this. Um, you know, I, I had to force my daughter to see her her three favorite movies from last year. Uh, if it wasn't for me, she would never have seen it. It was right, American right. Fiction, Iron Claw, and The Holdovers. And uh, would never have seen it without my recommendation. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is... You know, I'm I'm just fearful that that we're so inclined to accept uh, accept table scraps instead of a great meal of a great film. Uh, we have a lot here. I'm gonna yeah, go through this. Go. Go. Uh, Manny Lamont for five. Always great to see you guys. Garrett Hayden for four nine nine says I used to hear animators from BYU would get hired for Pixar, which is a Mormon so dominant school. I wonder what happened to them. I don't know. Um, uh, Puck, part one of the D files puck nine, seven, one for 10. Thanks for the good work. I got into indie films by reading film threat without paying and watching Jim Jarmusch films. By the way, did you guys watch dead man? Uh, uh, by Jarmusch. Jarmusch. Yeah. years ago. Yeah. Love it. Any plans to do a D files video essay? If not, I volunteer to do it for free. Been dying to get back into editing and such. Thank you. Joe Haas for four, nine, nine. Um, we are planning on doing a video. We're planning on doing video essays on the channel yeah. once a week. We'll do a video essay. Thank you, Joe, for that. Um, we're going to hold some of these comments. I'm going to go through the super chats only. Indies says Epic Mike. Hey, Epic Mike. And Film Threat is killing it. Thank you, Epic Thanks, Mike. Brother. Appreciate you. Appreciate you a lot. We're going to have Epic Mike on the show soon. He's got some epic stuff coming up. Thomas Pickett for five. The new technologies will help the indie creator. Entertainment is becoming decentralized. Mm -hmm. Agree. Yep. Darian Murphy for 499. Chris, I'm up for helping on your animated project. I just did a little title sequence, a title sequence for poor choices. It's on the Imperium Studio. Darian, hit me up. Go to filmthreat.com slash contact. That's how you get to me. And I'll tell you about my new project. I'm a putting, I'm assembling a team right now, is what I'm doing. Uh, Blacklist Animations would be a great studio, says Torgo the White for two. Ooh, Blacklist Animation. Mm -hmm. Love it. Uh, we've got a bunch of other comments we're going to hold until the end of the show, but uh, we have a special guest. So uh, we're going to, we're going to pivot here. We're going to pivot. We're going to pivot because I have a lot of things that we need to, to discuss. So give me a second to pivot here, folks. Okay. My apologies. Um, I got to, you know what? Hey, just for right now, where is that? 
I, Alan, I have it. I have it. Okay. Don't worry about it. Okay, just a sec. I love breasts. Women look at other women's breasts. Gay men love breasts. One thing that could unite the world is breasts and cleavage. I just, I really believe that. I truly believe in breasts. What was that about, Alan? It was about breasts. Yeah, I get that. That's crazy. All right. Time to pivot here for time to pivot. We have a special guest joining us from the WGA. That is the Writers Guild of America. Jim Agnew. Jim. Dude. How's it going? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Can you hear you? Perfect. How's it going? Good. Just to clarify, I'm not with the WJ, but I'm a member of the WGA. Right, right, right. You're yes, <laughs> not, not officially representing the WGA. You are no. a member. Uh, a, you're a screenwriter, a WGA screenwriter. Um, we've been covering a lot of stuff happening within the WGA. A lot of these um, DEI, uh, DEI and DEIA rules. And I got to ask, like right off the bat, and I'm going to bring up some stories and have you comment on it. And we'll also take uh, your questions and comments as well for the 2000 plus people that are currently watching smash that like button. Um, what do you think about these rules in general in a very short period of time? Like the last, like, I don't know, it hasn't even been 10 years, but the last like more than five years, there's been a huge, huge, I believe an overreach from the human resources department to creatives. The human resources department that you pointed out, we had a text exchange, said the HR department that probably has no experience in entertainment. What are your general thoughts about this? Yeah, I think, well, I think the big reason a lot of this has happened is because TV became so big and streamers. And those are obviously corporate entities. So right. everybody's got their fingers in everything. And the last thing, you know, look, it's, I've made quite a few films. It's very hard to make a really great film. You know, this one producer I know says, like, a movie like Swingers is great because every single person involved hit a home run. You know, for the lack of funds they had, Doug Lyman hit a home run. The actors hit a home run. The writers hit a home run. That's the only way you can make a good movie. So it's already stacked against you to try to make a good film or TV show. So then when you get, you know, all this kind of, like, white noise coming from all these places, you know, creatively, and then from people who don't know anything about filmmaking. You know, um, we talked about that Amazon stuff, you know, and there's a whole section about how you describe a character in a script. Everybody in the film industry who actually makes films and TV shows doesn't give a shit what it says. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Doesn't care what it says in that parenthetical after the character. No one sticks to that. That's like the most unimportant thing in the world. And just to give you a few, I, I guess back to your question is, I don't know where this is coming from, but it's just, not adding to making films better or TV shows, which we've all seen, you know, think, it's, it's more fingers in the, in the recipe and more cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. Well, it's always like, you, you, and this happens on a film set. Cause you've also directed films. You directed an indie sci-fi film. I think we covered it uh, several years ago. Uh, and, and which was great. And it, yeah. it, it's, it's, you're always getting, you know, you're getting pieces of advice and you, and sometimes, advice will come from an unlikely place and sometimes things will change in the casting process what to me one of the one of the most interesting you know castings that that um had a benefit was the movie night of the living dead from 1968 by george romero yeah. the lead character was a character in the script just named ben he was the smartest guy in the script he was the guy the audience looked to to like what was happening not barbara she was sort of crazed off her rocker from that experience with the zombie in the beginning of the movie and George Romero cast an actor named Dwayne Jones. Dwayne Jones happened to be black. He was just the best actor. Like, well, he's the best actor. He's delivering this stuff. If you remember the 1968 black and white night of the living dead kicked off the zombie genre, wrote <laughs> all the rules and everyone on the set asked him, he's talked about this many times. You can look it up. Are you going to rewrite the script? You're going to rewrite the script. Cause you know, you cast a black deck actor and he said, no, nope, not going to rewrite it. Not going to yeah. rewrite it at all. And you're missing opportunities to like, sometimes it's like 
But when you explicitly are telling people in the script, they must do certain things. This is from Amazon's page. I think a lot of this has to do with corporate, the over corporatization of entertainment, which comes from big tech, which every industry that big tech moves into, whether it's hotels or the taxi cab industry, it yeah. breaks the industry. It takes 30% for itself and it destroys that industry. I, I, I'm being dead serious. Look at any industry that big tech chooses, whether it's like food delivery, you know, everything, name it. Anyways. Yeah. Well, let me let me just give you an example after we talked about this and looked at this. I was trying to think, how would I, you know, pitch a TV show according to these these this whole guideline that's here we we see that Amazon and MGM are using? How would I pitch a, t uh, a film about a, a young, sexy FBI agent who gets help from an older man to solve the case? And the bad guy and the serial killer is a transsexual who was denied being, uh, you know, transitioned. How would I pitch that? It wouldn't exist under these rules. And you know what movie I just talked about? Silence of the Lambs. There you go. Oh, that's right. That's there effectively Silence of the Lambs. So was, this, this is the thing well, that bugs me is when I'm reading through this and people, it's this now, I don't know if, do you know this, uh, that we did a video on this, Jim, and Elon yeah. Musk tweeted out the video? No, I do not know that. That's that's pretty amazing. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, we should have talked about it at the top. But yeah, Elon Musk tweeted out this video, um, the video that Alan and I did about this, what we're looking at right now. What it tells you is it's creating all these new terrible tropes. I saw the movie uh, ISS, International Space Station. And it stars, the protagonist is a young black lesbian woman who you know by her identity, nothing is going to happen to her. And I was right. She, of course, survives. Spoiler alert, I ruined the movie for you. Um, but yeah, it's unbelievable here. Race and ethnicity, it goes through different types for black characters. For Hispanic, they're still using that term Latinx. I don't know any Hispanic friends of mine that like that term. They hate it. Well, here's, uh, here's the, sorry, here's the big problem no. with this. It's these people who created this think that just describing character is a character. They don't even understand the medium. It's it's a it's a, a visual medium. It's not how they're described on a page. It's how how what they do. You know, for example, I decided to look up a few other movies. Um, you know, Marion Ravenwood is described as beautiful, which you can't do here. But that's not what we look at when we see the movie. We see that she gets drunk when we first meet her. Where she's doing shots. She punches Andy. She fights. She does all this stuff in the first five minutes. That's the character, not what was said on the page of a document that's basically an internal document. These people are so caught up in like things that don't matter. Yeah, look at I didn't realize Mina was a thing. That's Middle Eastern slash North African characters. <laughs> Mina. Are they shown in violent situations, especially when linked to terrorism or religious extremism? Are they shown at the extremes of wealth, either as royalty sheiks or business tycoons, or at the other end of the spectrum in roles associated with poverty or as refugees? By the way, all those things exist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All those you know, things my friend is actually... that they're, they're yeah, right, my friend says they're they're in a sense uh, anglicizing uh, ethnic characters. By, oh. by taking away what makes their culture unique, uh, you now made them Anglo. You know, you, you can't have, you can't, you can't insist that a character or an actor do an accent. And, uh, and so the, they have to basically do an Anglo accent, uh, a white accent. And, and to me that just you, right there, you're working backwards. From yeah. You know, last night too, when we, we talked about doing this, I, I was like, look, um, I'll, I'll think of a few f films that would be totally blown out of the water by these these kind of rules, would never even get started, right? So I looked at, you know, Tarantino's Cinema Speculation, which everybody should read, and every single movie and every chapter he talks about would not get past go on this list. Every single one, Bullet, you know, Rolling Thunder, Taxi Driver, Getaway, let's just get rid of all those movies. They don't, they, they can't be made anymore. They, they don't exist. You know, and then I kind of went on a tangent, started thinking, you know, V for Vendetta, you can't do the good, the bad, the ugly, the Godfather films, you know, Fight Club, because you're talking about somebody with a disability. It just goes on and on and on. It's it's um, 
and we're going to talk, uh, we're going to pivot to some, to other things related, but this is so specific. Who put this much? I, I don't know who wrote the original, this original document, which I assume gets amended um, every once in a while to whatever new, you know, language is being used, but it, this playbook is disgusting and this needs to be, this needs to be rejected by the industry is people like yourself, people who are in the trenches, writing screenplays, writing the stories need to push back against this and say, you know what? We appreciate the suggestions. We're not going to listen to it because as you pointed out in our original exchange, when I sent this to you, what are the qualifications of these people? You pointed out that like one of the, one of the women from the HR department used to work at Caterpillar, which is construction vehicles in yeah, HR. We, what does she know about story? Does she know who Joseph Campbell is? Has she even read the Sid field book on, on screenwriting? Does she know about like different entertainment demographics, like different things they just do even different ages. There is so much, these rules will if these rules are adhered to, it's going to destroy the industry is my well, thought. Or it, it already is. I mean, listen, I can talk about it because at the moment for various reasons, which you can see, I'm not going to be hired by Amazon or MGM anytime soon. Um, <laughs> what, why, why are you not going to be hired? No, Jim? Why are you not going to be He's hired? Because <laughs> I, I'm a white straight male. Let's just get that out there. Uh, that's, that's no secret. Um, but the thing is it, it goes deeper too. It's like, it's a complete lack of understanding of how the film industry works, how you make films, because there's also a section in produc production where they basically say that a line producer should not use their crew they always use. They should expand out, hire new people. That's basically the line producer's job to have an experienced crew come in and knock a movie out. If you told me to like bring in half a new, I've produced over a dozen films. If you told me to bring in uh, half my crew as new people, and I'm responsible for sixty thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars or more a day we're spending. I can't on the job train a bunch of new people. You know, that's, okay, crazy. that's something. Well, look, look, Martin Scorsese, right? He's worked with a lot of the same people. He's worked with De Niro. He's worked with Leonardo DiCaprio. He's worked with Thelma Schoonmaker, his editor, to to dictate these rules and say you got to mix it up. Sure, you know, if Wally Fister's not available, uh, Christopher Nolan could hire a different director of photography, you yeah. know, or, 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 or if Hans Zimmer isn't available, you'll get someone else for Oppenheimer to do the score, right? Hans Zimmer really wanted to do Dune, which is why uh, he wasn't able to work on Oppenheimer, whatever. But there, there is, you know, there is a trust. When you mm -hmm. develop that trust, you work with different people that you like to work with in a creative space because you know sixty thousand dollars a day that's that's crazy that's not an indie film that's like a two million dollar yeah. film you're spending that you know per, right. per production day so it's like you get you you hire some young kids because you have to or you're forced to who don't know how to do gags and they can't blow a little charge on a on a car window you know to simulate a gunshot and you're sitting there for four hours you just wasted like you know a third of your whole day so that's twenty thousand dollars, but you gave somebody a new shot, you know. So, so that's even I find even more insane than I. It's all pretty insane. I mean, it's just you know, no one's gonna go. All movies do not fit into all things. You know, if somebody wants to go write a black lesbian love story, and that's their perspective, their point of view, they don't need all these rules. They're gonna write that. But when you're writing John Wick Five, you don't need to like apply the same rules as some you know indie film. It, they're, they're totally different things. It's like all things are not all things to all people. You just well, get a sense that they don't know what it's like to make a movie uh, or to, to tell a story or anything. You think? You know, that, they're well, sitting, uh, that they're sitting on the sidelines, you know, and, and have no empathy or idea that this is what happens on a set. And this is why, you know, you need reliable people to keep people safe, uh, to yeah, keep well, the, the story moving on. One other thing, sorry, I'm getting all fired up, Alan. Um, one other thing is it also says in this this whole outline that you should not describe, you know, character women as like girl next door or feisty or things like that. So the casting director won't be like boxed in. There is absolutely no casting director that works at a high level that is going to be like, hey, uh, it says feisty, so I can only bring in feisty Latinos. They're the opposite. They push you more than anyone creatively. 
and they will come up with so many different options. So it's kind of insulting to casting directors on top of it. It just shows a complete utter lack of understanding how things are made. Well, it's just annoying to have people who've never made a movie tell you how to make a movie. And and it's, it's there's that too. Yeah. There, yeah. There's that. Um, we're, we're going to, uh, we're going to go to your questions in just a second, but I have one last question for you, Jim, before we go to the chat is on fire with over 2000 people watching us live at the moment. Um, but one last question, does Hollywood push back against this? And do people like yourself start to speak out and say, we're not going to be bound by these rules. We're going to make, we're going to think about the audience first before we think about what's required on a corporate level. And we're, are, are people going to push back and stand up or is a thriving indie industry going to emerge from people just getting sick of this? Because there are so many qualified people like you not working right now. And it's disgusting to me that to see this entire industry implode. So do people push back or do, does a new industry emerge? Well, I think, look, people like me, I can push back. I can do pretty much whatever I want. I, I've still been working the last few years because I work mostly in indie films. I've sold TV shows. I, I've written pilots. You know, I've, I've done all, it all across the board. But my main, you know, bread and butter has always been indie films. There, they do not care about this stuff. You know how indie films put together? If you write a script that can get Guy Pierce in it, you can get four million bucks. It's that simple. It's no one cares about any of this stuff in the, in the indie film world. It's all, all a math problem, dollars and cents. And then secondarily, you try to be creative with it. The, but the poor people who like came up in TV, which has become so corporate with the streamers and all this stuff is in there. There's so many decent people, qualified people that are not working, can't find jobs because it's again, it's just become corporate. It's become weird. It's become DEI. I'm sure they don't want to push up against it. Um, you know, they want to, but they won't publicly, you know, because, you know, people whisper in my ear all the time. They're like, when is this going to end? This is stupid. I can't get a job. I got passed over for this. I'm doing double duty on this TV show because everybody, all the young writers are horrible, you know, but we'll see. I think the, the in state of the industry is what's going to change everything. Cause what did 800 people get laid off at Paramount yesterday? You know, hundreds at MGM the other day. So it's like. Everybody I know who works on the more corporate side is like freaking out. So there's 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 basically not going to be an industry, I think, in three or four years if it keeps going like this. And the thing is, this is why I speak out, because it's not going to be here anymore. And luckily, I'm older now, so I'll be okay without it. But instead of worrying about AI and things like that, we're worried about this. Right. Let's go to your comments and questions here. Let's see. We don't, we can take that off. Uh, and Vec for 10, Jim, does reading these guidelines convey any sense of passion or does it, does it evoke revulsion at the mere thought of such horrifically step-by-step -step genuine conveyance of experience is decimated? It's horrific. It's horrific. And here's the other thing too. It's like for young writers that want to get in the film business to see this stuff and hear this stuff and, and have them already worried about making mistakes or being too edgy or anything. That's how you break in the film business. You write a pilot or a spec that is edgy and unique and cool, and it might never get made, but it will open doors for you. But if you write something like everybody else, guess what? You're just gonna get passed over. Yeah. Thomas Pickett for five, diversity's goal isn't trying to find the best people, it is trying to correct what they perceived, what are perceived wrongs of the past is Thomas Pickett, who goes on to say for five, isn't that the whole point of diversity? It is important of what the person is and not important what the person does. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I, that's his perspective. Mine is just that, I, look, I don't think these people with DEI are trying to like destroy the industry. I think it, inadvertently they are because they don't understand how creative stuff works. There's a reason there's only 12,000 people in the Writers Guild. And every time I hear stats and stuff, it's half of them are working. The other half, and this is at peak TV, like 6,500 people were making enough to make, you know, uh, their pension and health, which is only like $40,000 a year. So it's a very specified group of people. It's hard to get in. I've been around a very long time. I got, I'm lucky I've been doing this for a long time and I was able to get in, but if you think there's only 6,500 people in the country making a living as TV and, and film writers, 
what does the person who worked in HR at some other big company know about screenwriting and filmmaking? Right. You know, when the other's half of the WJ can't get jobs. And that's more. Uh, Darth Racer for 10 says, I believe in the US Constitution and boobs, so sign me up. And then <laughs> Albert Neda Retro says, Lee Harvey Oswald took out the wrong candidate. I think. Kennedy, I think you <laughs> let's not let's not have comments like that. I know you're talking about Kathleen. All right. Okay. All right. Uh GRS for 20 says the HR takeover reminds me of a Steve Jobs quote. This is a quote from Steve Jobs. Many companies forget what it means to make great products. After initial success, sales and marketing people take over, and the product people eventually make their way out. Yeah. Garrett Hayden for 499 says, I'm going to create nothing for Hollywood. I'm taking my chances in Japan. Less racism to white males there. It's interesting to well, note. That note. You should, I mean, listen, anybody who wants to get in the film business, I would even say right now, don't spend your time like trying to write a bunch of spec scripts and stuff. Go shoot something. You can do it for cheap. Make waves like that. They'll come to you. If you do something that makes, it doesn't matter what it's about, you know, unless it's like some kind of really you know, far out thing. But if you do something entertaining and cool, people will come to you. Didn't Kanye looking... just shoot a Super Bowl commercial on an iPhone and just, but he spent $7 million on it and then made like 20 million after it aired. Yeah. But he like, he's like buying a spot on the Super Bowl. Correct me on the facts if I am not going to get it right, but how are you spending $7 million with an iPhone? That's... No, no. He paid to run it during the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. But he just shot the commercial on a iPhone. All right. Comment here from Changer of Ways, Beep Bop Boop for Five says, I was a screenwriting student from BYU, abandoned my career after seeing the writing on the wall. Most did. Which that I think is sad. But, you know, it's like, you know, I, I've considered myself very lucky. I've been able to just do, I've done nothing but write for 15 years. And before that I produced indie films. So for 25 years, I've made a living just doing this. It's great, but you should still try and work on it, but you got to work different angles, you know? And like it just said, create, go shoot something. You know, we were talking about swingers earlier, you know, what swingers cost $250,000. You could shoot swingers out for $10,000, really the way they shot it with the technology you have in the editing, you know, yeah. go make a, go make a short, go make a film. That's the way to really make some waves. Thomas Pickett for five says, oh, yes, they are destroying remaking. Study collectivism. This is what fascism, communism, and progression, progresses it, pro progressive, progressive. Pro yeah, progressive does. From Eric Sullivan, Eric O. Sullivan for 20 says, it is about postmodern ideas of power. They want the power to scare you and push you around. Why is it working? It's all Ivy League business school grads. It's all academia doesn't sell well to blue collar folk, does it? There's a little bit yeah. of truth in that, I think. But yeah. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Well, um, uh, Marcus Glover sends in a super sticker. I but feel like that they they don't make television. They watch it and they comment on it, and that's how they get their money. Like, essentially, we could we could become one of these uh, DEI consultants. Yeah. Well, there's an old saying in the film business: just because you can drive a car doesn't mean you can fix it. Because you can watch a movie and critique it doesn't mean you know how to make one. Yeah. Uh, from Rumble, Sam Tesla says, uh, Jim, you probably burned some bridges with this interview. Are you worried about potential backlash? What are your plans moving forward? <laughs> I'll figure Have that you? out. I completely burned down my career in the next 10 minutes. Um, no, I'm I'm at the point in my career where I've been very lucky. I've worked with a lot of great people. I, I, I can just say what I want now. It's like, you know, I'll still get work. I'll still get things made. You know, and like I said, mostly I work in indie film. And, Indie film does not care about, you know, anything except the bottom line, really, you know? So it's like, uh, you know, if, if it, I get completely burned, I'll just start doing a uh, film critiques on film threat. How's that? <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, do you think it's like, worth it for by, by the way, uh, new, well, uh, I was by the way, say, do you think it's worth it for a new writer to even want to go into the big studio system? It look, it's, it's, I always say, look, if you do a indie film, if you try to put an indie film together, it's like starting your own business. You have to do a lot of work. You have to like, for years, I've had scripts. I One script that took me five years to get made. And at one point, Antoine Fuqua was going to direct it. Ethan Hawke was going to be in it. It took years and years and years. It's a blacklist script. And I just kept pushing. I felt like Sifia is pushing the boulder up the hill. 
And finally, you know, it was 10 years ago, Nick Cage said he would do it. And Paco Cabezas, who's a big TV director, directed it. We got it made, you know? So it took five years of grinding and grinding and grinding. Um, and that that work pays off, but it it's just, I don't know, what was the original question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, is it even worth wanting to go into the big studio system? I mean, not the studio system. I mean, okay, this is what I was saying. I'm sorry, guys. Um, but when you work more like that, put a feature together, especially on the indie side, it's like you're starting a business. But if you go try to get into TV or do a studio film, and studio films are really hard to get those jobs, um, you're basically working for somebody. You're going, you're 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 an employee as opposed to kind of having your own little beat them that you're kind of have some some you know, small business, basically. yeah you're starting a small business as opposed to working for the man uh so davina you, duckworth right. asks can jim talk about the whisper networks are there whisper networks i don't even know what those are oh, okay what, how what, common what? is it is it for someone to have their material stolen by a colleague during a sensitivity session says brock samson i mean look, <laughs> well we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in a minute but okay there's there's an old there's an old thought process that like look if you have a great idea and someone steals it and that was your only idea you shouldn't be trying to be a screenwriter anyway you know um and too, too many people get caught up in that kind of stuff it's like and the only people i ever hear talk about are usually amateur writers it's sure things get stolen i have we have someday have to do this story about how an entire script of mine got stolen and turned into two movies after that that's that whole thing I mentioned to you once before. We'll, we'll have to do yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I think my NDA is over on that one. Um, oh, and nice. that was a, just flat out they reused the script. But um, but you know, don't worry about that kind of stuff. Don't just copyright. Don't register your stuff with the WJ. Or if you do, always copyright. Always copyright. 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 And Eric O'Sullivan says tw for twenty says, "Hey Jim, I paid twenty bucks for that." Next question. Bad form, kid. Says uh, thanks, Chris and Alan. <laughs> Wait, what? What? I thought Jim's been pretty forthcoming here. Sorry about okay. that, Eric. Sorry. And he gave, Sorry, said, Eric. Not another 20 bucks to tell us that. Uh, Patrick Lemire says, imagine being a good actor or writer who fits in these categories and everyone assumes you are, you are a diversity hire. It's going to harm more careers than it helps. That, that, I, that could be very true. I don't know of any specific instances because... Most here's the thing is almost everybody in the film industry, 99% of them are not racist or or look at even this stuff. You know, yeah. it's it's kind of the outside influence that makes such a big deal about it. And then um Patrick Lemire for 499 goes on to say, So Jim, Sundance is not indie film anymore. They seem to be down with all the new rules. Any danger of it taking indie? I think I think Sundance is its own thing. It's very much a they curate a certain type of film. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. And, and indie film is a decentralized, it. it's pretty decentralized. So, yeah, uh, it's not going to affect each other. Yeah. And then Tom Siebert says kudos to Jim for coming forward here. Well, it's not like Jim is coming forward. He's just a filmmaker and a screenwriter and directed and produced projects. And it's just like, Jim, the reason I think it's important to just, and you can find Jim on IMDb, you can look at all the, his projects and find where to see his films and, and see his, you know, breadth of experiences like there is another path everyone thinks you know i want to go to hollywood and it's like but you don't have to i mean that's what film threat's been all about is like hey um consider a different way to get that and then you're not going to be burdened by these rules where you might just get hired because for certain reasons that may not be for the best reasons yeah yeah and also too the more you're in the system the more things are are, are a letdown look I've had some films get made that I'm just, I'm almost embarrassed by that were great scripts. And by the time, you know, bad producers, bad, you know, there was, we did one movie where that suddenly this producer wanted to have like a cop drive around in a, in a Bentley. It's like, wait, what? It made no sense. Then we found out he could get half off a of Rolls Royce if he put a, it in the movie. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on guys. And that's how bad movies get made. It's just, there's so many people, you know, that bring money in too, that have different agendas. There, you know, I just did something for Sony. I, I'm not going to say anything bad about it yet. It hasn't even, it's not even through post, but let's just Does say. Does it rhyme with Schmadam Schmeb? No, but one of, <laughs> no, no, it's a small action film, but let's just say that uh, I saw some of it and I was like, who's this character in it? Cause I wrote it. And I was like, and it, then it, it just some girl shows up who's terrible and it's the financier's daughter. 
or girlfriend. I was well, just going to ask you that. That seems to happen all the time. It's always the financiers, like daughter or girlfriend. Yeah. Or wife or mistress. Yeah. Um, John, uh, Janan Klassen for two says thoughts and prayers with the K Kansas City <laughs> NFL parade. <clears throat> Why did something happen? Yeah, or? Somebody, somebody shot. There, there's some shots fired. I don't know. What Are you happened. kidding me? Oh, yeah. Oh my God. What yeah. world do we live in? Oh God. Uh, Red French Moon says, My question to Jim I know the artist doesn't need to be like the Moulin Rouge cliche, but where is the creation in all of that? The romanticism of creativity, even in showbiz, it existed before. Well, you know, the romance of creativity is when you're young. You know, that's that's right. When you do it. And when you're first getting in, it's like, unfortunately, I'll admit it, too. It's like I was a much better writer when I was trying to break in because I could just be crazy, you know, and try whatever. Now I'm more calculating because I'm like, if I'm going to spend three months writing a script, I want to get paid for it. I want to option it right away. I want to try to get it made. So I'll be like, OK, how does this appeal to actors? What's the market? You know, so I'm more cynical, but I'm also older and I got a kid and a girlfriend. We got to pay the bills, you know. But yeah, when you're young and you're trying to get in, that's when you write, you just go crazy, right? Five or six of the most insane scripts ever. Break every rule, you know? Now I want to ask you about something else, Jim, we were talking yeah. about. Uh, we did a story on the sensitivity read, and I think I discussed that with you. And come to learn that um, the the sensitivity read, this this group was featured in a story called why are so many wannabe screenwriters getting scammed from pitch fests to online script coaches? Any wannabe Hollywood screenwriters are getting scammed. Uh, this is from 2018, July yeah. 31st, 2018 from the Hollywood reporter. We'll put a link in the description for this video, but there are a lot of groups. I mean, there are, look, there's, if you're an up and coming screenwriter, director, filmmaker, there are a lot of, programs i mean quentin tarantino famously took dove ss simmons directing seminar where he basically says you got to make your days that's like the big thing that like quentin learned was you got to make your days when you're when you're a director that's what you got to do you got to make your days well yeah. there are a lot of other consultants people you can give money to and we did a story about the sensitivity read and we showed about like 15 minutes of a video that was from a longer seminar uh, the people, this organization that was featured in that video is actually in this article. And we got into, you, you and I were having a text exchange about a lot of things. I mean, some of these companies charge a lot of money to look at your script, to give you advice with sort of the dream down the road. What do you think of some of these organizations? I'm trying to find the well, exact. I think there's a simple, simple formula. If you're going to pay anybody money to give you advice on a script, make sure they've sold scripts. And they've had right. movies made. It's pretty simple because there's a lot of people who give a lot of advice. And look, I've been brought in to rewrite scripts many times where somebody hired somebody who were one of these coaches. They paid them $20,000 and they just made a mess of the whole thing, like unreadable. And I can fix that like in three days and take half as much money because I know what I'm doing. So it's like, okay, I'll fix this for you. But it comes down to like, you know... <sighs> I, I, I've never read a book about how to write a screenplay. I just look at screenplays online. And that's what I tell people all the time. You know, instead of paying for all this stuff and joining these classes, look at, watch Aaron Sorkin videos on YouTube. You know, intention and obstacle. You know, it's all there. I don't think you need to spend money. Now, let if you can find somebody who's actually done it, you know, or has a track record as a real producer, a real writer, then sure, then it's worth paying them money because they have real world uh, experience as well. Because it's not just about writing scripts. It's about how do you sell a script? How do you get a script made? Because every step of the way is different. You write a script to get attention with producers. Then the producers want a different draft for actors. Then maybe a different draft for financiers. So it's this whole intricate, you know, game you've got to kind of maneuver and manage to get a movie down 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 the road or else you're stuck and i don't think any of these people know that kind of stuff here i find the found the quote it says uh, roadmap writers which is the sensitivity reading uh, where that came from is one of several companies that provides a script analysis and other forms of counsel among its offerings are brief telephone consultations with executives 
who will read the first few pages of the screenplay and chat about it for 15 minutes at a cost of $45 or $275 for a full hour. Among those offering their insight, two junior managers who have no clients listed at IMDb <laughs> and a development assistant with an independent production company. Roadmap CEO Joey Tuccio did not respond to a request for comment. Um, so yeah, this this was brought to my attention. Also, someone who um someone actually who used to work at Slam Dance um told me he worked with roadmap writers and actually got very good advice directly from Joey. So there are some mixed signals with that. Uh, I think I think my issue with the sensitivity read is you would never get Quentin Tarantino. You would never get filmmakers um, like Kevin Smith. And if you sub submit yourself to a sensitivity read, uh, I, I think what you're doing is you're giving over some type of control to someone else. And I think that that kind of feedback can be destructive rather than constructive. And I... I I don't think it's going to result in uh, you actually improving your script to sell it. Uh, so, and it just, to me, it's, it's another gatekeeping and it's um what, what annoys me too, is that like, we can debate these issues. I disagree. The other thing is they're only looking at sensitivity one direction. I feel like what's recently become in Hollywood because Hollywood used to champion blue collar workers. If you look at old Hollywood movies, even in the seventies and eighties, who were, who were uh, the heroes? people who were blue collar freaking um you know uh uh bill murray drives a cab in stripes you know has a bad day movie. there's so many movies blue collar blue collar workers were championed by hollywood in so many films not anymore in fact uh, a, a shorthand in modern hollywood if someone has a southern accent that means they're racist now, are you going to do a sensitivity read and have a white person read the script to see how they might be sensitive to certain things in your script and might be offended? The, the sensitivity read only seems to go one direction where sensitivity for certain types of people. And you know what? I, I think it's another way to police art. I'm against it. And I think if I think if you're going to do it, get a diversity of opinion, not yeah. one opinion. Um, well, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Here's the thing. It's all stupid to me. I think this is all really dumb because the thing is, especially if you're doing a film, I mean, TV is a little bit different because you're trying to write a sample. But if you're trying to write a script to get it made, a feature film, you write for a movie star. You don't write about like, I don't want to offend this person, that person. You want to get something made and do it fast. You write something that like somebody wants to make. It's that it's not that complicated. And there's certain ways you can structure the script and make sure they work like don't have 50 characters. Have one character who's trying to get somewhere, you know, with everything stopping them. And it, like, like Sorkin says, obstacle and attention. Just somebody's trying to get somewhere, there's obstacles in their way. They're trying to do something, there's obstacles in their way. And if you write something like that, you know, you can even make, you can make it a black lesbian who's trying to get, it doesn't matter. It's like, but those things don't matter. What matters is what you write, the, the market, the, the, you know, the, does it appeal to movie stars? Does it appeal to people who can get your film financed? Because if you, if you're super sensitive and great, you know, five of the people from, you know, Riverdale want to do it, but nobody knows who they are, you know, maybe they're a big star now. It doesn't matter. Your movie will never get made. So, you know, on that note too, I got so mad, Chris, about this whole sensitivity thing, because I think they are scamming people that you don't mind me just pitching one thing really quick. If, if people sure. want to go to my own website and just send me email, I think I'm going to do a free Zoom in two, three weeks and everybody can come and I'll give advice like how to sell your script. Not how well, to write what's, what's, script. what's the website? What's the website? Just jamesjagnew.com. All right, I'm going to go to it right now. We're going to share it. Yeah, if you so just, send just do email, this for free. I'm going to do it for free. Uh, any, anybody who sends me an email, I'll email everybody back a Zoom. We'll spend like, like five minutes talking about it just and i'll show you you don't need to pay 300 dollars for somebody to say your script's not sensitive enough all right i'm going to share a screen with uh james j agnew <laughs> there it is look at this there it is. i'm gonna accept your cookies thanks for the cookie james and all right recent work <laughs> there it is all that we destroy it's on hulu you got uh yeah. something on hulu well, just, just as a side note, if anybody goes, what does Jim know? Jim's got, I've had over $40 million invested into scripts I've written. So 
I, I, I have some some say in all this, you know. And by the way, what I love, you keep film threat in your bio. Yeah. Look at that. It says a former contributor writer to film threat who played guitar for the industrial rock group hate departments. I, I wow. think that's how cool I am. Now that I'm well, older, Jim, I'm like, wow, was cool once. You've worked with Dario Argento, John Carpenter, Oscar. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Worked with Nicholas Reffin, Antoine Fuqua, creatively. So you know, I know, I know how these things work. But what I really want to help people with is, look, there's a million people who take your money how to write a script. I don't like teaching people how to really write scripts unless I'm really working with them one on one seriously. But I know a lot of tricks of how to make your script better that you can sell it, and that's what I want to teach people. And I don't, you know, it's free advice. It's like just do this. Don't track your characters, you know, make them show up page one. Don't have like your lead show up page seven. There's just little tricks you can learn that producers love and actors love. And, you know, don't waste time on sensitivity readings and things like that. All right. All right. I guess well, Road, Roadmap um, ain't calling me now that I burned down my career. So that's <laughs> enough. I just I just burned two well, uh, avenues well, of employment in one hour. I got a whole thing from uh, a letter from them. And they were like trying to convince me I was wrong. Like, why are you so upset that sensitivity readings are being done? It's clearly they didn't watch the video or even think for a minute that how this could be perverted and used in a bad way. But my whole thing is you're not going to get new up and coming people who have something different to say because you're gatekeeping in, and in the worst way possible. And the whole thing they were talking about uncomfortable conversations, basically struggle sessions. It was the most manipulative email uh i started to respond to it i don't know i'll, I'll and, whatever and here's the thing i've been very lucky to work with some of the highest level execs in the film business none of them give a crap about any of that stuff you know if you wrote a script that was like super racist and super like backwards you know they'd be like what the hell is this but outside of that they're not going to go i don't know if that's the true you know experience of that underdeveloped you know or or you know person they don't they don't care they're gonna be like john wick shit we can turn this into a franchise that's how most of them think, unfortunately, and and for the you know, and for good reason too. Well, you would not get Blazing Saddles written by you know Richard Pryor, Mel Brooks. No, which you know, um, you know. Tony, I, I used to work for Tony K many years ago, and Tony K is one of the smartest guys I've ever met, and he made American History X. You think that would get made nowadays? And with these these rules, no, it wouldn't even get past go. And it has a lot to say about race, in a in yeah. a good way. You know, but according to those rules that we just went over, uh, American History X wouldn't even get past go. So, well, let me know if you want to like. You could even host it here if you wanted to on Film Threat Streamyard. We could do like a special if you don't want to do Zoom or do your own. But like, go through Jim and we'll figure it out. I'm saying, I if you need help, we know how to yeah, do yeah. this stuff. Well, you know, yeah, I'm not very high tech. Like I said, uh, Anna did my website. You know, it, it looks Chris, great. Chris and Alan are my girlfriends, so that's what we're talking about. I've known Anna for years. She's in the documentary Attack of the Doc. Anna David. Yeah. Now she, people know you've been you've been <laughs> outed, Jim. You're with an incredibly beautiful, <laughs> intelligent woman. Yeah. Well, and you're a very lucky man. And another G4 uh, alumni like you, Chris. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, oh my oh, God! Look, look, thanks for having me on. I hope you know I still have a career. If not, I'll just hang out with you guys every Thursday well, night and watch movies. We got a few more. Like we'll see oh, yeah. some quick, quick. Time. Okay, real quick. Okay, uh, Anvec gifted five film threat memberships. Check out the exclusive videos for members only. Bass player two thousand two thousand eleven five for four nine nine. If Tarantino took his scripts to a sensitivity read, his films would just be title cards. One hundred percent. I just. It's one thing we were talking about doing like as a joke. What if we asked someone to do a sensitivity read, sent them like the script for Blazing Saddles, but just called it Blazing Saddles Part Two? <laughs> that could be kind of fun. How would they even know the difference? They've never seen Blazing Saddles. <laughs> uh, Thomas Pickett for five says, great podcast, writers slash blockbusters screenwriting podcast. Thanks for the recommendation. Rarified Air just sends in five. Thank you for that. Uh, Albert Nada Retro for two. My source was Wikipedia. Albert Nada Retro for 10, Whisper Network is an informal chain of information passed privately between people, usually women. It consists of gossip about people in a work community alleged of being sexual harassers or abusers. Oh, okay. That's related. It's not, not related to what we're talking about. That's related to um, the D files. Yeah. The D files, which you weren't here for that. So, I mean, listen, uh, there's lots of screenwriters I know who, um, 
and and showrunners and stuff who will we'll talk about this stuff you know when we're around each other you know they won't they right. can't say anything you know they don't and and they make a lot more money than i do in tv so it's like they i understand it's like they got families they got kids in college they can't you know i'm a little bit more pirate uh, more of a pirate than they are so right uh, patrick lemire says james agnew is awesome man crush <laughs> oh well there you go uh question for the guest best experience and worst experience in the industry says saint michael archangel uh archangel. it was all it, it was all in the same movie we did i i wrote the first film i wrote that got made was in italy with adrian brody and dario gento and uh, that's a whole book in itself that those three months in italy were the most chaotic crazy fun and depressing time because we ran out of money. We didn't have enough money. There were lawsuits, but it was just a blast. I mean, I, I, I went to church with Dario Gento on a Sunday morning. Like that's how crazy it was. You know, the, uh, uh we got a big fist fight in, uh, at the, uh, <laughs> at the rap party and they threw a backpack out in a river. And then me and this other guy I worked with ended up staying out all night and Adrian Brody's, uh, stand in and they thought we were dead. <laughs> the next day, while we were hung over at somebody's house we didn't even know and the state department was looking for us i mean that that's a whole book in itself that so it was a it was one film that was just non-stop adventures disappointments excitement chaos it was cool and bad too at the same time uh joe not a fed for two says american history latin x could get made mm, okay. there you go um <laughs> richard s says i heard that when you describe a character if a character has no ethnicity, the default is white. Is that true? No, that's wrong. That's wrong. Uh, most people, too, I know who are very experienced screenwriters don't give any description anymore. And it, and it depends on where you're at, too, in the process. You know, it's if it doesn't add to the story and you don't need it, you don't need it, you know? Right. So, yeah, it's it's no, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means actually kind of means the opposite. It means you're open to anybody. Right. And from Rumble, you shout that, out to everyone. That, that this movie never comes into... Uh, uh, wait, at what point does ethnicity come into a project that you're working on? If, if, if it's specific, I mean, like, like, let's say you're doing something, you know, you're doing Mississippi burning, there, then some people have to be, yeah. you know, but if it's, if it's, uh, you know, an action thing or something, you'll get all kinds of things across the board. You know, I have this project that I'm trying to direct that I've been working on. It's very much like layer cake, right? And it has a 32 year old lead who's like a drug dealer and there's, I, you know, it got pretty far down the, 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 the line and the casting director just threw everybody at me. Cause I didn't put any ethnicity. There were in, there was, I think Deb Patel was on there. Everybody was on there, you know, white guys, Asian guys, cause it didn't matter. So, you know, it, it, if it's not specific, you're open to anything. What usually ends up happening though, it's like, who's the person who brings the most financing to the film? That's usually the decision. You know, if it's, uh, what's Denzel Washington's kid's name? Uh, uh, the, the guy who was in Tenet, you know, he, John David he, Washington. Yeah, he maybe two years ago would have been like at the bottom list. Now he'd be at the top of the list, you know, for like a five million dollar film. So you know, yeah, it's all about uh, name value too. Uh, just a few more comments here, Jim, and then we'll let you go. Uh, Techniques says a blacklist of white men. I don't know. Well, I don't know if there's a, there's not an official one. There's you know. <laughs> Uh, well, it could never be an official one. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And then from Rumble, shout out to everyone watching us on Rumble. We appreciate you. From J. Aldwin Combat, Jedi with Sith. Sith standing for storytelling, <laughs> integrity, talent, and honesty. Loved that comment from Gary's show yesterday. Yeah, so we've been talking about the Jedi training. This is separate from, we did a follow-up story to that uh, anonymous uh, writer. And we got, we've been getting, we're still getting feedback from people. We're going to do a follow-up story. The the stuff that people are telling us comes from all levels of the industry, from the art directors guild to editors, to production designers, um, all this uh, DEIA training and whatnot has just infected everything. Yeah. And I, I mean, look, the, the last thing, last thing I'll say about that is I don't think anybody had bad intentions. It's just, it's trying to put like a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't, it might work if you have like, you know, 10,000 factory workers at Amazon, but it doesn't work in the creative field. The creative field is the creative field. It should be really how they should hire everybody is if you're going to hire 10 writers on a TV show, rip off the cover pages of all of them, read them and the four best hire. 
You know, right. don't even know who you're reading. That's that's really what you know. I always thought this industry was like that, but you know, it's changed a bit. So, you know, yeah. it was thought it was best person got the job, but you know, there you go. His career goes down in flames. <laughs> Uh, Jim, hey man, I want to thank you for being on here, answering our questions, responding to the sensitivity read video, and then also just for your uh, honesty, bravery, and uh, continue fighting the good fight with indie film. Go to jamesjagnew.com. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, you're going to be doing a seminar. If we yeah, can we'll help with it or help promote it. Yeah, let's figure that out. I just thought about it last night. I was like, you know, because over COVID, I did some thing on Facebook groups where I an answered one question, you know, per person about the industry. And I ended up doing thousands of them, you know, and, and you've been on a, what's the thing we've been on? Film Courage, you know. Film I've Courage. You and I, you got me hooked up with Film Courage. Yeah, yeah. And I've got so many just great responses and people. I love, I love helping people. Look, there's so many ways, there's so many books and so many ways to learn how to write a script that I don't want to help people do that unless, like I said, unless it's something we're doing a lot, you know, like they're they're like, okay, hey, I want you to be my coach. Fine. That that's more invasive, but I can't read your script in 10 minutes and tell you how to fix it. But I can give you a lot of tricks how to sell it, you know, and how to make it more for producers, actors, and that stuff. So so, but I don't want people to get down. Just keep writing and doing creative stuff. Don't, you know, don't let me make it look all bleak. It's like you, you you can still get in. If I can get in, anybody can. I'm just a dumb kid from Lancaster, crystal meth capital of the world, who barely got out of college. So <laughs> that's great. So uh, I still have my way in. But you know, I, I did a lot of hard work though, too. It's a lot of hard work. One, I'll just say one last thing because people don't understand it. You've got to write many specs. Don't just write one and think it's gonna get made. You have to write like 10 and figure out what you're doing. Like Alan said earlier, 10,000 hours, you've got to do it. You know, yeah. you got to spend the time. Yeah. Well, we will let people know about your seminar on the community tab on YouTube. We post, you know, screenings and other interesting information or for Alan's meetup in Austin, Texas or South by Southwest. We'll post cool. that info there. So go to the YouTube community tab. We'll promote on social media. We'll just do a seminar led by you. Yeah. We can help, we'll help. For free. We're not going to charge people. Free. Yeah. Right. All right. Cool. Great. Okay. Right, thanks, Jim. guys. Take care. Thanks, Later, man. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Jim's logging off here. Yeah. All right. That was fantastic. Okay, we can make it exclusive to members. And <laughs> well, I don't want to do that because if we make it exclusive to members, then I you know. do have to pay. I think it's like two bucks to be a member. And I don't want to do that. Jim wants it to be free. Maybe we do it for members first. And then we just publicly release the video. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We have one last thing to talk no, about. Free. We got to do it at least for the first one free. Yeah, of course. Of course. But um, guess what? It is Valentine's Day. It is Valentine's Day. Folks, check this out. This story here, which was on the front page of The Hollywood Reporter, 50 Reasons We Still Love Hollywood. Oh. An article that just came out. And since this is a day of love, I'm sorry. Sorry. Alan? Got it. Got it. I got it. Trying to help this you. This is out a here. day of love. I want to go through what some of these are. And uh, I'm going to present the opposite argument here. So um, I. We, we still love Hollywood. Come on. I love movies. I love movies for sure. But. Um, where we are in terms of Hollywood, I have issues. I have issues. Where is this story? Okay. Um, right here from the Hollywood Reporter, 50 Reasons We Still Love Hollywood. I just want to see, Alan, if you agree with some of these reasons. Okay. So I'm going to go and just read a couple. But for every reason, I might give you one that you may not like. All right. All right. So here we go from the Hollywood reporter here. Look at that graphic. Aww. That's great. Ryan Gosling, a little Aww. montage of very LA things. Let's go. Uh, and it's, so it says, let's not sugarcoat it. 2023 was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year for Hollywood. Then goes on to talk about how terrible the year was. And this is sort of supposed to be uplifting. Okay. So. Wait, where's the story? What? Where's the, do I have to like? Go through it? Huh? 
Uh, it looks like you might have to go to the magazine. Sure, I'll go to the magazine. <laughs> and I'm going to find the 50 reasons in here. Why are you doing that? Why don't you read some chat questions, Alan? Yeah, let's do that. Anything. Oops, no. From Lord Thoth, we still love Hollywood. Feels like a divorce to me. Oh, we still love Hollywood? Feels like a divorce to me. Uh, whoops, and I just uh, got rid of the other chat question at start. <laughs> uh, but let's see. Tom, Tim Smith says, who loves Hollywood rainbow pro propaganda? Uh, this is the list. Okay, so here we go. I found the list. Or wait, this isn't, this isn't the list. No, that's the article you just pulled up, wasn't it? All right. You know what? We're going to end it there <laughs> because we're having, you can't read it from the magazine. So. I can't read it from the magazine. It's not, I can't find the story. All right. We're ending it there. You know what? Let me tell you what I, okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. All right. I'm going to get rid of that comment here. Here's what I'll tell you. Hollywood sucks. And this is all a lie. All right. 50 reasons we still love Hollywood. I got 500 reasons this place sucks. It's, it's, a, it's a caste system like India with PAs and interns at the bottom. All that casting couch nonsense. Going to guess it's still happening. Okay. Secondly, parking in LA sucks. The, the, um, trying to get anywhere is awful. The cost of living in this city is the worst. If you're just starting out, good luck. You're living in a two bedroom with five people with your possessions in a milk crate. Hollywood isn't the dream. It shouldn't be any longer. What you should do is make an independent film. That's my rant. And I'm sticking to it. Look at this. Red French Moon says, how do they find 50? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there you are. All right. Friday, we're talking about Madam Web. We'll also get Alan's first impressions of Dune Part 2. Alan has seen it. We're going to get your reaction. Additionally, we're going to have on a special guest. That's the founder of Shorts.TV, Carter Pilcher, is going to be joining us on the show, talking about all of the Oscar shorts. He is releasing them to theaters, his company, Shorts.TV. We're going to talk about all the Oscar-nominated short films. Plus, Bob Marley, One Love, is finally in theaters. And the best part about that. I don't have to suffer through that trailer anymore. <laughs> I'm so tired of that trailer. Oh my gosh. I have seen that trailer for six months. I'm over it. Just show me the movie. So we're going to talk about that. We've got other movies we'll be talking about. Alan, anything else happening that I missed? Uh, no, I've been so obsessed with the D files. So go out and read the D files part three. And Monday debuting the first episode of our third live stream. That's right. Three live streams, Monday, Wednesday, Friday versus it's a group show. I think we've got, I've already got like eight or nine people already booked. Might book some more people just as a backup. So there you go. Uh, but I want to thank you for watching us, supporting us, read the D files on filmthreat.com. It's on the front of filmthreat.com right now. Keep it on the front, Alan, for a little bit. Yes. And then move it to the, It'll be on all, all day today. All day today, read the whole story. Uh, D files part four is coming when it looks like you're about to be murdered. Behind <laughs> you is like goofy. Me, yeah, you like my goofy the D files or, uh, part goofy. four is coming when. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, someone's calling me right now. Uh, D files part four will probably be in three weeks as well. And for a super chat from Aaron Sleeper, uh. PMAs for the future look to the past 40 years ago. An animator felt Disney had lost his soul and quality. Bluth 
almost single-handedly forced the Disney Ren. Okay. Renaissance. Renaissance. Yes. Um, that's Don Bluth, who uh yeah, basically started his own thing. And that's what you do. From from the yeah, from the ashes comes better stuff. And Mm -hmm. I want to also thank our mods for today, Lord Thoth, Mexican Iron Man, Latino Slant. Subscribe to their channels. Also, want to thank Glenn Brown and Ms. P Coffee. And there you go. Jeez. All right. Alan. All right. Let's get out of here. Wait, can you oh, say God. that again? <laughs> what? Say it again. All right. Set me up. Come on, Alan. Let's come get on. out of here. Come on. Come on.